remember. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, that was fair warning because on the one hand, what we're going to do tonight is look at the Old Testament, as the title says, specifically with the idea of can we look at only the Old Testament and get the idea of the Christian Godhead in it okay, without any appeal to the New Testament? So on the one hand, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, this is like, wow, this, this should be interesting. This is good news. I'm, I'm sort of already on board. But on the other hand, in the process of doing this, I do have certain aims as far as why we would bother jumping into the subject. And I'm going to explain those as we go on. But in the process of, of sort of trying to hit those targets and show you how to look at certain Old Testament passages with those targets in mind, you're going to see some things that are going to be very new and might even be a little, little edgy or a little scary. Um, I, I sort of doubt it tonight, but in other weeks that might be more of the case. But what you'll see tonight is very useful in a number of ways in terms of apologetics, in terms of uh, our theology, our doctrine, the continuity between the Testaments, um, uh, Jewish evangelism, uh, all different sorts of ways that this is going to apply, but it's going to be different in some places. So with that in mind, when I ask about the Old Testament, the Jewish Godhead, the first question that might pop in your head is what's the payoff? Why do we need to think about this? We already have the New Testament. The payoff, again, is going to be Jewish evangelism. If you have a friend who's a Jew, one of the things that they stumble over the easiest is the idea that if you know, how can you worship Jesus and be a monotheist? How can I accept the idea that Jesus is God and God is God and not be a heretic? Okay, just you know, not be going off the deep end and just giving up something that is essential to the Bible that you claim to believe in. I mean, you got this thing in the Old Testament, and you got the Shema, the Lord here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I mean, right away that you, you just have a barrier. So we're going to be looking at that, and in succeeding weeks, we're going to see how once you're sort of over the hurdle of divine plurality, okay, this, this plural idea, which we're going to hit tonight, you start to get into an Old Testament doctrine. Believe it or not, this was Jewish theology up until the end of the second century, right after the Christian era. It used to be, pardon the pun, kosher. <laughs> in Judaism to believe in what, what they called then two powers in heaven. Two, like two Yahwehs. Not one good and evil, both good guys. That was normative Judaism until after the Christian era. So we'll be hitting that the second week, but we might get a little taste of it tonight. But we've got to get over this divine plurality hurdle before we get to what you could really show a Jewish friend in terms of, hey, your Old Testament is not really different than the New Testament. You just got to look at it a little bit you know, from different angles, and you're going to come out in the same place. The other is apologetic discussion. Now, in terms of your experience, you may have run into certain groups. Jehovah's Witnesses would be one. Uh, Mormonism uh, would be another. You might have seen specials on television where academics are talking about Christianity, and it's, you, know, you don't recognize it for the Christianity you're familiar with, and also sort of weird ideas about Jesus that you might see on TV or hear on the radio. All of these groups are saying things about Jesus that in the course of the four weeks we're going to cover here, I'm going to show you from either the Old Testament or just how to understand the Testaments in tandem, how to deal with that. Now, for Jehovah's Witnesses, they're, they're more famous for denying that Jesus was a deity, okay? was God in the flesh. He's a created being to a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Mormons sort of see lots of gods, 
uh, in their Bible, and Jesus and Lucifer are like brothers. So they have many God figures, and they're all sort of equal and interchangeable. Uh, the academics are fond of saying things like, you know, the New Testament authors, the New Testament guys, they just sort of made this up about a trinity or a Godhead. You won't find this in the Old Testament. So they were literally sucking it out of their thumb. So why should we pay any attention to, to them? They were aberrant. They were, they were not consistent. Or they'll say the New Testament writers use the Old Testament in such a way where they're just using it badly or incorrectly. They're reading things into it. And again, Jesus revisionists this, this whole notion of, you know, Jesus being either non-existent or some, you know, odd sort of figure that was saying things about himself that, again, he was just making up. There's also biblical continuity and interpretive clarity. Your te the two testaments are very consistent with each other. Even if something is fundamentally Christian as a Godhead, you will see in the Old Testament. You just sort of have to know what you're looking at and what to look for. What we'll cover as well will, in some ways, clear up a lot of weird passages. Uh, there are a lot of these uh, between the Testaments, and I think we'll get some help there. But the big one is contextualized theology. And by that I mean this old thing of interpreting in context. Now, everybody talks about this. But my question is, how serious are you about it? Because, again, this is, this is sort of a little bit of warning here. Biblical theology did not begin with any of these theologians. I have all the big names up here. And of course, the bottom is any theologian you can sort of fill in the blank with. There are certain things that you need to think like an ancient Israelite to get. And we're going to cover some of those tonight, and we'll show you how. It's valuable. Biblical theology is framed by the world, the people who created it. And they're not from the Middle Ages. They're not from the Reformation era. They're not modern. There's a lot of odd things going on. So to get to these points, this is what we're going to cover in succeeding weeks. Monotheism, of course, tonight, then the two powers. Then we're going to talk about how Jews interpreted the two powers idea that they see in the Old Testament is they didn't all flock to Jesus. Okay, they had different ideas. And then lastly, Psalm 82, which will come up tonight as well. So understanding Israel's monotheism is the subject for tonight. And you might think, well, what's to understand? There's only one God. Well, some things just aren't as simple as they appear. Uh, specifically, Many Jews, again, see a belief in Jesus as God as a problem. We need to be able to fit, catch this, we need, need to be able to fit the idea of Jesus as God, and then God is still there, into monotheism. Somehow that needs to be monotheistic. You know, if you're talking to a Jewish friend, you've got you to be able to do that. And then we talked about some of the beliefs of scholars, other religions, and again, sort of, is your theology invented? So these are the problems, again, just by way of review that we're going to try to address. And on the way to doing that, we want to start with a monotheism test. On the left-hand column here, these are common Hebrew terms for God. Now, most of you, I would think, probably know all of these. The numbers next to them are in round numbers, how many times you'll see that occur in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. So Elohim, a lot, a thousand. El is sort of a shorter form, a couple hundred times. Yahweh, the divine name, is the most frequently used. And then Eloah is most often in the book of Job, but I threw it in here to be consistent. So we have four terms for God. I want to look at Elohim tonight, the, the top one here. Now look at this carefully. The term Elohim is used to describe this list. And take a look at the list. The God of Israel is naturally Elohim. The gods of the nations are called Elohim. 
In fact, in this verse, 1 Kings 11.33, you get three of them. And one of them is a goddess, which oddly enough, biblical Hebrew does not have a word for goddess. It still uses Elohim, even though there was a word for goddess in, in Canaanite. The gods of Yahweh's counsel, Psalm 82.1. We'll hit Psalm 82 tonight. If, you, if you're not, if you're thinking, well, what does that mean? We'll get there. Now, this one you're probably going to be familiar with. Believe it or not, in Deuteronomy 32.17, demons, the Hebrew word is shadim, are called Elohim in that verse. 1 Samuel 28, remember the story when Saul visits the medium at Endor and says, hey, can you bring up Samuel? I want to talk to him because I'm just in heap big trouble. And she doesn't know who he is right away, and she goes through whatever machination she goes through, and it works because she says, oh, no, you know, I, I see an Elohim coming up out of the ground. And then Saul asks, what does he look like? And then she describes him, and he goes, you got him. <laughs> That's Samuel. And then they have this conversation, and Samuel is not too happy with Saul, and says, you know, you're essentially your, your history is Saul. You're going to bite the dust. God's going to do this, that, and the other thing, and all that comes to pass. Well, it's really curious that you have the deceased human dead called Elohim. The last one here, angels, and I have a question mark because it, it depends on how you take a couple passages and sort of some nitty-gritty things in the text, but I would argue that at the very least, the angel of the Lord is called Elohim, and possibly you get a plural use in Genesis 32. We're not going to worry too much about that tonight. Next week we'll hit some of that. Now here's your monotheism test. Take a look at the list. Lots of things called Elohim. Here's the first question. Get it up here. Is there more than one Elohim that is real or that exists? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Anybody else say yes? We've had three now. <laughs> Four. Do I hear five? <laughs> You're all looking at me like, like my classes look at me like, I know there's some trick here. What is he doing? <laughs> Okay, I would say yes. It's kind of obvious because I just gave you the list. Now here's the problem. Are you a monotheist then? How many say yes? Are you a monotheist? If you believe in more than one Elohim, and you know, these can't be the Trinity. Demons aren't in the Trinity. I don't, you know, last time I checked, they weren't. Deceased human dead, I don't think any of our aunts and uncles or departed loved ones are up there in the Trinity. So we have plural Elohim. Yep, they're right there, I see them, but I'm a monotheist. Right, you, you see the sort of, I mean, there's some tension here because we're used to thinking of the term monotheist in a certain way. And by the way, the way we think of it does not conform to the list. That's the problem. That's the tension we feel. So on the one hand, the use of the Hebrew term is really clear. All you got to do is look up Elohim in a concordance. You're going to find those verses. I mean, it might take you a while because you've got a few thousand hits to go through. But our English translations often obscure what I just showed you. Here's an example. This is 1 Samuel 28, 13. Now, I have the red line here for a reason. Because the ESV, to the left of the red line, that does a really good job of telling you what word the Hebrew you know, actually has. It uses G-O-D, small G-O-D. I see a God, I see Elohim coming up out of the earth. These other ones, look at what they do with it. I see a spirit. You know, it's just a neutral term. You can't tell. Divine being, well, that's not bad. Spirit, ghostly figure. Oh. <laughs> I mean, come on. And this last one here, I can't quite read spirit. Now, if you were looking at, at these translations, you'd never guess that what you have is Elohim. 
you might think spirit. Oh, maybe it's ruach, because that's the Hebrew word for spirit. No, it's not what's actually there. Here's another one, Deuteronomy 32, 17. Red lines over here. So I think these four translations do a pretty good job with this. Look at the NASB over here. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, big G. The word there is Eloah, by the way. To gods, to Elohim, whom they have not known, so on and so forth. So this translation carefully distinguishes that the beings that, that the Israelites wound up sacrificing to were not God, were not the, the true God, but they were other gods, you know, bad ones, ones that they should not have been worshiping. So these translations do a good job over here. Now, if that isn't a contradictory translation or contradictory thought, I don't know what is. They sacrificed to demons which were no gods, to gods they had never known. Well, like, are they or aren't they? It doesn't make any sense and demons that were no gods to gods then. Again, what, what's going on there? I'm not going to guess at what's going on in the, the translator's mind. Translators have a tough job, but that just really isn't a very good translation. <laughs> Psalm 82, 1. Again, here's our red line. Psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. By the way, this is Elohim. In the midst of the gods, this is also Elohim except this one is plural, he holds judgment. So New King James, ESV, do a pretty good job. Here we have heavenly beings, rulers, like, like with 12 inches. Yeah, that was an attempt at a joke. Yeah. Okay, rulers, and then I, this is my favorite right here, gods and scare quotes. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Come on, it, it's just your Bible. You don't need to put scare quotes around, around things. <laughs> so, again, you, you see that, that you have a problem if you're dependent on English translations and you're not using things like concordances to sort of get down under the surface a little bit. You'd never know. You know it's, it's sort of just a hit or miss proposition. Now, I think at least part of the reason why these and other verses have this sort of translational difficulty or problem, where the translator's like, oh, I don't know what I should put here, is because we are used to looking at the letters G, O, and D in that order, and thinking of that word in light of a specific and unique set of attributes. That's what we're used to doing. But that isn't what the biblical writers did with the word, because they apply it to you know, six different things. So that alone should tell you the fact that a, an inspired biblical writer would use the term Elohim of some, you know, flunky demon over here, or again, spirit of, you know, the, the deceased human dead. That alone should tell you that the biblical writer did not attach a specific set of attributes to the word. <coughs> to him, it meant something different. Now again, here's our list, and these figures, these entities, are not equal in attributes. Again, obviously an angel is not at the level of the God of Israel. None of these are at the level of the God of Israel. So it can't be about attributes. What a, what a biblical writer would say, if, if, you, if, you, if you walk up to a biblical writer and said, hey, I want to know if you're a monotheist. I want to know if you, if you believe that only one Elohim exists. He'd look at you and go, of course not. I mean, you know, haven't you read the stuff we've been producing here? You know, you go to these passages, and this is how we use Elohim, and all sorts of things. And then, he, you know, you, you'd hear him say that, and it would be like, man, I can't fellowship with you. You know, you're just off limits here. You're a heretic. If you change the question a little bit, that would allow him to say what he really thought, he would say something like this. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. If you asked him, do you believe in a single unique Elohim in the entire spiritual world? Do you believe that or not? Do you believe there's one of those and only one or not? He'd say, sure, absolutely. 
He's the one we should worship. He's the one that's the creator. He, you know, fill in the blank. Then you start talking about attributes once you get past that point. But again, we're just not used to thinking in these terms. What Elohim really means, if you need a succinct definition, is it's a term that you would use to denote what I call place of residence. That is, if I called something an Elohim, it meant that thing lives over there in the spiritual world. If I call you an Elohim, that means I believe you are a, an inhabitant. Your proper domain is not my world. It's the spiritual world. And if you look at that, again, all of these are Elohim. I just took the, the list and put them in this sort of little diagram that represents the spiritual world. And you have where the Elohim live. That's where they're from. That's how you identify an inhabitant of that realm. A summary to this point. Here's what I want you to get from where we've gone so far. The biblical use of the word Elohim shows us that it's not tied to a specific set of attributes. That explains why more than one thing gets described with the term. English translations at time obscure that. And important point, since Elohim is not about attributes, the biblical writers were not denying monotheism by using that word to describe other figures they believed were real that were also Elohim. Now, if you were thinking this, if you understood that this term really refers to the spiritual world, something in the spiritual world, it undercuts the threat and the problem of a Christian going to a Jew and talking about Jesus as God, let's just say Jesus as Elohim, along with God the Father as Elohim. It, they can handle that. that now, they're going to want to know about attributes, for sure. Is, are you drawing an equation? You know, are, is it like a, a pecking order or what? But they're, they're over the first hurdle. They're over the first hump. Again, for Jews, divine plurality language should not be a threat. Again, I've, I've been, usually accidentally, I've been in, in rooms that were filled with Jewish people going through this. Uh, I've told you this story before. In, in grad school, I started going through a lot of this stuff, especially what I'll cover next week on the two powers of heaven. And I could just see that we were having a communication problem. And so I said, do I need to repeat anything? Do I need to go over this again? And a little old lady in the front row said, my rabbi never told me this. And I said, oh, you're Jewish. And then some, some guy in the back yells out, we're all Jewish. You know, there's like 50 people in the room. <laughs> it's like, well, I didn't know that. That would have been handy. <laughs> you, know, you start looking for the exits. Um, but they were, they were really nice about it. But I had no idea. But this was a big deal. Because if you start leading them by the hand and, and getting them over this sort of threat of, of you know, plural language for God, they can sort of go with you to the next step. Now, let's move on from this point. What about Yahweh, the God of Israel, and these other beings? We'll say a little bit about that. Before I do that, do you have any questions up to this point that we could stop for questions? Yes? Jesus said, doesn't your scripture say you are God? Ah. Yes. He's quoting Psalm 82. He is quoting the Psalm directly and exactly. He's quote, it's verse 6 to be more precise. Now, uh, in, in the fourth week, we're going to spend almost the whole session on Psalm 82 because I'll just telegraph it this way. The common view of Jesus' quotation of Psalm 82.6, it's in John 10.34 if you wanted to look at it, is that 
Jesus and the rest of the Jews in the audience thought that the Elohim, the gods of Psalm 82.6, were just people. I don't believe that at all. Okay. I think Jesus understood his Old Testament, and he understood what Elohim meant. The issue is, if you just say it's people, what it amounts to is that Jesus is saying, hey, look, guys, I know you're upset with me. I know I've been walking around here, you know, doing amazing things, and, and when people are saying, you know, it's the Messiah, the Son of God, God's come to earth, all this stuff, I haven't told them to shut up. So I know you're upset with me. And I just said, I and my Father are one, a few verses back. But you know what? You need to let me do that because I get to call myself God just like anybody else. How does that make any sense? If Jesus thinks the gods of Psalm 82 are people, that's what, he, that's what, the, that's what commentators have him saying. I, I can do it because you guys can do it. it. Makes no sense at all. But if he's thinking of them as divine beings, it's a different story, especially because four verses earlier, he said, I and my father are one. And right after he quotes it, what else is he going to say? God is in me and I'm in him. Okay, he's going to say, look, your own Bible has divine plurality language in it. Take a look. You're supposed to know that. Now, you should learn from that, that other non-human beings are called Elohim. So you shouldn't be throwing anything at me for that. But you know what? I'm more than just one of these Elohim in, the, in Yahweh's council of Psalm 82. I'm him. I'm the Lord of the council. So you better watch what you're saying. Okay, two entirely different ways of looking at it. And I'm going to walk you through it on the fourth week. But that's a, that was a, that's a significant verse. You know, to drive you know, home the point that, he, that he's trying to make, to reinforce what he said in two other occasions in the same chapter. So any other questions? Okay, well, let's jump in here. We'll hit Psalm 82 a little bit. For the rest of, of tonight, I want to sort of focus on two points or, or have these two points in your mind. One is, again, that Yahweh, while Yahweh is an Elohim and no other Elohim are Yahweh, that means Yahweh is inherently superior. He is in command. He is ontologically, fancy theological word there, ontology means what a thing is. He, by definition, is superior to anything else in the spiritual world. And, of course, our world, too. So that's one thought to keep in the back of our minds. The other one is this sonship language that you will see associated with certain Elohim in the spiritual world gets rightly applied to divine beings because God created all those other divine beings, not only humans, without threatening monotheism. So the, the first hurdle you have to sort of cross is this idea of, <clears throat> again, especially if you're, if you have someone who's like, like a Jewish person really devoted to the Old Testament and the Shema, it's like, I, I shouldn't even be using phrases like plural gods or plural Elohim because I, you know, God's going to strike me down because the Lord our God is one. We, that's a hurdle we can get over. Now, let's talk about, since Divine plurality doesn't interfere with monotheism. Let's talk about this divine son idea. Because to a Jew, who is the son of God to a Jew? There are two candidates in the Old Testament. This is like Old Testament final jeopardy here. Okay. Who is the son of God in the Old Testament? Who gets called my son? Israel. Israel. You know, Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I have called my son. Okay, referring back to the Exodus. Who else? The other passage for that is when, when uh, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and they request to 
you know, be, have permission to leave Egypt. You know, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that my son can go out in the desert and worship me. Again, it's a corporate reference. But what's the other candidate? Who does God call my son? The king. The Israelite king. Okay, there's some, some, some psalms to that effect. So if you're a Jew, and you know your Old Testament, you're thinking, oh, okay, you know, all this divine son stuff, you know. I don't know about that, because... Look, I, I get the divine plurality thing, but Jesus is saying he's the son of God. He's not Israel, and he's not the king. I mean, he's just this, like, carpenter guy. So I don't know if I can buy that. That seems to contradict this whole, you know, divine plurality thing that Jesus could be, you know, divine. Well, no, it doesn't, because we have passages like Psalm 82 where this, the same language is applied to these beings. Again, these are just baby steps. You know, to, to get a, a, a Jewish person to think about divine plurality from their own Bible without use of the New Testament. God has taken his place in the divine council. You know, you have, or you see, you see, you have God in blue here. The column here in blue, we have Elohim is the term. This is singular. This is a good translation. This is the ESV. We know it's singular because the verb it goes with taken his place is singular. Nitzav is a singular participle. I mention that because Elohim as a word is what grammarians call morphologically plural. That is the shape, the spelling of the word is plural. If you know a little bit of Hebrew, you know that words, nouns that end in im are plural. Elohim, plural. Okay, so the shape of the word is plural. But in most cases throughout the, the whole Old Testament, the meaning of the term is actually singular. You say, well, how do you know, Mike? You're just saying that because you want to say that, you know, blah, 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 blah. No, actually, there's this thing we call grammar. <laughs> and I know it's boring, but it's really useful on occasion. Uh, Elohim is actually a word like in English, deer, D-E-E-R, or sheep. Okay, if I walked up to you and said, sheep, more than one or just one? You're like, other than thinking, who is this crazy man? You're thinking, oh, I don't know. It's just a word. Put it in a sentence. If I say the sheep is lost, how many? One. Grammar tells you that. If I say the sheep are lost, more than one. Hebrew is the same way. You have to look at what the noun is partnered with to tell you if it's singular or plural. Okay, just like English. Now, if you go to the second half of the verse, so here Elohim has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the, here we have another blue column, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Now this one has to be plural because this nasty thing called a preposition tells us that it's plural. You can't be in the midst of one. And of course, our first reaction as Christians is, oh, this must be the Trinity. Trust me, in Psalm 82, you do not want the Trinity. Because if you read the rest of the Psalm, what happens to the Elohim? God says, you guys are jerks. <laughs> I mean, they, they get blasted for being corrupt and evil. You don't want the Trinity in Psalm 82. Um, it just, it's real, just really bad theology uh, to do that. So here we have in one verse, Elohim two times, one singular, one plural. But again, depending on the translation you're using, it just, you, know, you may not notice that at all. Let me go back here. Um, the other, just, just again, we'll, we'll spend more time in Psalm 82 on, in week four. But I do get a lot of pushback uh, for, for this, uh, this Psalm 82 business. Th this is sort of where I live. I'm going to really impress you now and say this was the focus of my dissertation, and it was. <laughs> uh, but this, this is like my favorite subject, but I get a lot of pushback on it, and I understand why. One of the things you'll hear is, well, this council, this, again, this, they must just be people. You know, and then somebody will quote you know, Jesus in John chapter 10, not realizing that that undermines his deity in the passage. 
Well, really it's not, because if you go over to Psalm 89, here we have, the, isn't, isn't this amazing? Just look at this. You go back to Psalm 82, absolutely literal. Elohim, plural. Here we have the heavenly beings. It's B'nai Elim. Elim is the plural. El, singular God, plural, gods. Sons of the gods or sons of God. Okay. But here we get heavenly beings. Same translation. You know, a couple psalms over. Why? I don't know. But here we have, again, a reference to the assembly, council, council of the holy ones, heavenly beings. And guess where the council is? It's in the skies. So the last time I checked, human beings don't like rule the cosmos or the nations in the skies. Okay, it's a reference again to the spiritual world. It's this idea that God is a heavenly host and they work for him and they better do what they're told because if they don't, they're gonna get punished. And it's not terribly difficult. Back to Psalm 82, here's the verse that is quoted in John 10. God says to the Elohim of his council, I said, you are gods, Elohim, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. Again, you don't want the Trinity here. Okay, it's just not a good idea. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Again, this is a, this is a declaration that because of your corrupt administration of what I gave you to do, ruling the nations, as we'll find out, because you did not do a good job, and part of their failure was having men allowing humans to worship them instead of the true God. We find out from Deuteronomy. Because of that, I'm going to strip you of your immortality. You see, I'm bigger than you are. I made you, not the other way around. I gave you life, and I can take it. Now here's the passage that's sort of the springboard for what in the world Psalm 82 is talking about. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, and verse 43. You'll notice I have two translations here. NIV, ESV. One says, sons of Israel. In fact, most of your English translations will have sons of Israel. The other one says, sons of God. Now let's look at the verse. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up all humankind, all mankind, when did that happen? When did the nations get divided? Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. When God did that, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. And here we have according to the number of the sons of God. ESV is one of the few translations that will have this. That is the reading in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's also the reading in the Septuagint. So the oldest manuscripts of the, of the Hebrew Bible we have read sons of God uh, in this passage. Now, I don't wanna get into this too far. We'll, we'll do it in, in the fourth week. What the story is here is that God, if you remember back to the Tower of Babel episode, we get a little more detail here. God looks down, humanity is not dispersing as he had commanded them to do. He goes down, confuses their languages, and splits everybody up, and then they disperse. The chapter prior to that, Genesis 10, we have the table of nations. It gives a list okay, of the nations that are, you know, are associated with Genesis 11. What happens here is God says, okay, you don't want to listen to me. We thought that the flood would sort of take care of this, but it didn't. You don't want to listen to me. I'm not going to be your God anymore. I'm going to split you up. I'm going to put you under the authority of lesser divine beings, sons of God who work for me. And I'm going to create a people of my own from scratch. That people was Israel. Israel does not exist at the time of the Tower of Babel because God hasn't called Abraham yet. And Israel's not listed in the table of nations for that reason. This is why it says, he divides the peoples up according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, also known as Israel, is his allotted heritage. So this is the story of the rest of the Old Testament in a nutshell. This is 
the beginning of the antagonism between Israel and everybody else and between God and other deities, other pantheons. This is the Old Testament explanation for why the other nations have their own pantheons, why they're messed up, because God punished them by abandoning them, disinheriting them. Now, we know from the very next chapter, when God calls Abram, what does God say about the nations? Does he forget them? Are they just dead meat for the rest of you know, human history? No, he says, when he calls Abram, he says, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay, so he hasn't forgotten them, but they are under punishment. So again, I don't want to get too far into that. Here are just a list of references where you get this sun language. Right here, the B'nai, sons of God, B'nai Elohim, B'nai Elim, in the Old Testament. And coming back to the Shema, is all of this a violation of the Shema? Because again, we're, we're, we're trying to get people, again, specifically I have, I've been highlighting the, the Jewish person here, over the hump, of looking at their own Bible, their own Old Testament, you know, saying it's okay to recognize divine plurality because Elohim just talks about where a being it lives and where he's from. It has nothing to do with attributes. And some of those Elohim are, are, are sons. That we have this sonship language going on. It's not a violation of the Shema. I have five translations here of the Shema because the Shema is like the most difficult verse in the Bible to translate. You think, well, look at that. It's just a few words. What's so hard about that? In Hebrew, there are no verbs. There isn't a single verb in Deuteronomy 6.5. You have to supply it. So any one of these can work grammatically, but they all have something in common. The Lord is our God, our God, our God, our God, our God. Yahweh is our God. Now that makes sense in view of divine plurality because the Israelites believed in a whole spiritual world populated with other Elohim. And in fact, God had punished the nations and some of those Elohim had become corrupt and they were demanding and receiving worship from other peoples instead of the true God. And God said, look, I'm gonna bring you out of Egypt, but you stay away from the other gods. You stay out of their territory, you don't intermarry with them, you stay away from them because he knows the threat is real. Again, it's the whole Old Testament, just in a nutshell. This is why in the Old Testament you get this sense of certain areas were owned or under the domain of different deities. This comes through in the biblical story. I've shared some of this before in other sessions we've done, but one of my favorite stories of this is uh, well, we, we actually just hit one in Samuel. We're going through 1 Samuel. You know when the, the Ark of the Covenant goes out <clears throat> and the Ark is captured by the Philistines and they take it back to Dagon's temple? Remember the story? And then they, you know, they go in the next day and Dagon's flat in his face and his arms are hacked off and all this stuff. You know? <laughs> I love the description. But, but what's even better about it is when they, when they prop him back up, you get this line in the narrative that says... And this is why to this day the priests of Dagon don't walk across the threshold. I mean, what does that mean? It's because it was Yahweh's turf. So when they go into the temple of Dagon, good morning, Dagon. Oh, I need something on the other side of the room. I'm just going to like step over here and I'm going to walk around. <laughs> because in their thinking, Yahweh owns that ground because he defeated Dagon. That is holy ground to the God of Israel. Nahum and the leper. Okay, he gets healed miraculously by Elisha. Can't pay the prophet. And he finally gives up and says, okay, I got to go back home now. Can I have your permission? Maybe some of you remember this. What does Naaman ask Elijah to take back home with him. He wants two, he wants to load two mules with dirt. 
Why would he ask for dirt? This is why he'd ask for dirt. Because he knows, he even says, now I know that the Lord, he is God. And he says, now look, I'd like to take some dirt back with me. Because it's part of my job. You know, I got this king and he's old. So that, like, I have to take him into the temple of Ramon, his god, to worship. And so he's old. I got to take him by the arm and we we sort of shuffle. I always think of Tim Conway. I I know I'm dating myself here, but the old Taylor guy. We're going to shuffle along here. And when he, like, bows to Dagon, you know, I probably, I might have to, like, go down with him because I'm, I'm hanging on to the guy. He's just old. But I'd like some dirt to take with me. Why? It's protection, okay? It's, I don't know if he, it, we're not told, is he going to, like, sprinkle some? Like, okay, I'm, I'm safe now. I'm, I'm in the temple of Ramon, but I got, I got Israel, Israelite dirt with me. I got Yahweh dirt with me. Or is he just going to hold some or put it around his neck, put it in a little bag, put it in his pocket? Who knows? But to him, it's cosmic geography. This is Yahweh's territory, and I'm taking it with me. I can't live here. Got a job, got kids back home and all that stuff. I'm an important man, but I'm taking dirt with me. So what does Elisha say? Yeah, it'll work. Sure, good idea. Go ahead. Take all you can carry. <laughs> you know, we got more of that. You know, or, you know, so you, you get this, again, this sense that Yahweh is our God. This is what the Shema means. The Shema is not a denial of all this other stuff we've looked at. There's a context for it. You know, it's just not one we're used to. And you might be thinking, what about statements like, there's none beside me, none like me? They're not denials of the existence of other Elohim. They're statements of Yahweh's incomparability. I... No, I'll just point out, some of these denials are in Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. They're in Deuteronomy 4, which is the parallel. Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20 is the parallel to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. You get two denial statements in Deuteronomy 4, verses 35 and 39. Well, what's going on there? I've, you know, Deuteronomy 32 said the demons are gods, and they must be real because we can't deny that demons are real. And, and now you got this nun beside me stuff. What's going on? I'm so confused. Well... If you think of them as statements of incomparability, there actually is no problem. Now, I, here's a list of places, and I want to focus in on these two. Uh, these are all denial statements, and their formula, if you can read a little Hebrew. Right down here, the city of Babylon says, there is none beside me, there is none like me. And over here in Zephaniah, it's Nineveh that says that. Exactly the same phrases, a couple of these phrases over here, that are in the denial statements. Now here's the question. Is, is Babylon really saying, hey, I just want everybody to know that there are no other cities in the world? Just me. No, that's absurd. All you got to do is travel a couple miles and you run into one. The whole point is that Babylon is saying, I'm the best. None can compare to me. And that's what the denial statements are about. So by way of ending summary, a couple of thoughts to take away. We have this list here. Again, the Shema not being a contradiction to divine plurality, affirming the uniqueness of Yahweh. Divine plurality is not inconsistent with monotheism. And it paves the way for the next step, which is next week, of explaining how Christianity grew out of Judaism. Now, we're going to see next week that the Old Testament identifies one particular Elohim as Yahweh, along with Yahweh. I'm going to show you passages where you have God and this other figure in the same passage, and they're indistinguishable. And, and, and some of, there are some things that you, you sort of miss in the English translation that are pretty dramatic. To sort of telegraph that, what you have in the Old Testament is you have Yahweh invisible and Yahweh visible, and sometimes they're in the same scene. And sometimes the visible one is the Yahweh you think of, other times the visible one is the other Yahweh. And you say, well, that's confusing. There's like two Yahwehs and one is but isn't Yahweh. And yeah, that's exactly the way we talk about Jesus, if you think about it. Jesus is God, but he isn't. He's, he's God, but he's not the Father. 
Again, the Old Testament has those categories already in it. Okay? They, they were tracking mentally with the idea of two. And we'll, you know, we'll get to three as well, but they're tracking on two. On the one hand, it's an easy shift to accept the, for a Jew intellectually, to accept the idea, okay, we got Yahweh and we got this other Yahweh, well, okay, I, 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 know, I know what you're talking about. But the other time, it was, it was a life-altering, life-threatening decision to turn your back on Judaism and become one of these Christian people because you had to believe that Jesus was the second one, the co-equal second person. That was a huge step but they had the categories already in their head. Now, I wanted to make a few comments about scholars. The next time you see a TLC special or a PBS special or a Nova special, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, BBC, and they talk about how, you know, this New Testament stuff, you know, I just think they were making that up. Or the early Christians wouldn't even have known what they were talking about, this Jesus is God business, and Paul made that up. And then Paul and the early church, they were actually disagreed on their theology. Next time you hear about that, just kind of smile to yourself and say, you're just not too bright. <laughs> okay? You don't know your Old Testament context for the New Testament very well, Dr. So-and-so, do you? Because you don't. You don't. You either have to be ignorant of it or you just have to deceive your audience and not give it to them. And that's usually what's going on. Uh, I think we've hit this before. Last point, again, this is but isn't Yahweh thinking. Again, that's what I want you to sort of be tracking on for next time. So, a teaser. Last slide. I'm not, you know, some of you will, will know this because you've, you've, you've heard me bring this up before. Others, this will be new to you. There's something odd about these two verses. Don't guess now, because I'm not going to tell you if you're right. <laughs> the first one is a little easier than the second one. There's something odd that's going on in these two verses. And I'm, I'll be referencing those next week when we hit the two powers idea. I don't have any problem telling you that tonight, and don't take this like the, the next two weeks will be less interesting, but what we're going to cover tonight is my favorite thing to do in lectures. This is my favorite topic because I think this is probably the most easily transferable component of the four weeks, at least in terms of importance to someone who just hasn't had their head in all this stuff uh, like I have. And that is something as centrally, fundamentally Christian, Christological, as the, an idea like the deity of Christ actually has very strong roots in the Old Testament. And I know you've had inklings of that before. You've probably read something or heard something about Jesus in the Old Testament and those sorts of things. But I'm going to show you tonight a number of places where if you just have your, your senses sort of tuned to what you're looking at, I think it, you're going to be struck by the, the Godhead of the Old Testament. The, the, there's, a, there's a two-ness that's very easy to see. We're going to go through how you know, for lack of a better term, binatarianism, okay, two, how that's evident in the Old Testament. And I'm going to use that to trickle over into three. And then next week we're going to talk about how Jews before Jesus looked at what I'm going to show you tonight and then also how, how Christians parse things so you can get an idea of what the discussion was in the first century before the New Testament was even written about the Old Testament and a Godhead, because that's what they were talking about. They were getting it somewhere prior to uh, Jesus coming to earth, beginning his ministry, and prior to a New Testament ever even existing. And so the, the people that God used to write the New Testament, 
they're not just getting this out of the ether. It's not all new revelation. Okay, they're being taught either you know, directly or directed, or, or they've had, in Paul's case, a lot of schooling. They're looking back at their Old Testament, and they're seeing Jesus in all sorts of ways. And this one is particularly important because of, again, the Christian idea that, that Jesus is God incarnate. So, with that in mind, let's jump in here and hope my my thing works. If it doesn't, we'll just use the button. Let's use the button. Last week, just to review a little bit, by way of summary, the, the, the thoughts I wanted you to take away from the session was that divine plurality did not conflict with monotheism. And again, to a Jew, that was a big deal for obvious reasons. So that thought from last week, heading into this week when we get this Godhead idea, I'm hoping that you'll see that, that the Jewish mind, I mean, a Jew who was really concerned about his faith, that he or she could hear the claims of the apostles and hear this idea that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was God incarnate, that they had some place mentally to put that where it made sense. And they didn't feel that they were violating monotheism. We also said Yahweh was unique among Elohim. Now, we talked about Elohim last week, how the term uh, was not attached to a set of attributes, and that's why the biblical writers could use it of, an, of a whole assortment of things. One of those Elohim was Yahweh, and he was, again, my, the phrase I like, he was species unique. There was none like him in terms of what he is and what he could do. Okay, and that's just standard Trinitarian theology. But what's different about it is I'm getting you to think about it in, in very you know, more ancient terms than your New Testament. And the third thing that we mentioned was that one of the Elohim, besides Yahweh, I mentioned this at the very end, is going to get identified with Yahweh. Let me just say that again. One of the other Elohim, because one of the figures that Elohim could get applied to was an angel, one of the Elohim is going to get identified with Yahweh himself. Now, if you're following that trajectory, right away you have this feeling of, well, there's two but they're sort of the same because they're identified with each other. And, and one of them is Yahweh, so the other one must in some sense be Yahweh as well. That's where we're going to camp tonight. So I showed you this slide about a practical sense, you know, why this is important. And we covered the first option. So tonight, second week, Judaism's two powers in heaven doctrine. Now I say Judaism because... Judaism, Jewish theology, before there ever was Christianity, Jewish theology had the notion that there were two powers in heaven. That's not my term. That's a term you will find in rabbinic writings. The second power, the lesser Yahweh, the second God, the second Yahweh. You, you actually find this in Jewish rabbinic writings. And it has a context, and we're going to go into what that context is. So, the Israelite Godhead, the Old Testament precursor to Christianity's belief in Jesus as God. <clears throat> the Shema, of course, we looked at last week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we have a Jew that would affirm that. And then we get to John 1.18, and we read this. No one has ever seen God. The only God, catch the wording here. The only God, only kind of suggests one who is at the Father's side. Now, wait a minute. How can you have the only God at the Father's side? Isn't that two? Because one of them is the Father, the other one isn't. But they're both God. And, and this one over here is the only... Uh, just look at the terminology that's being used right in the text. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. So it's this one over here has made the Father known. But they're, somehow they're both at the same level, and the, the peripheral one is actually called the only God here. So how in the world can a Jew, how could a first century Jew, and that's what John was, how can he affirm the faith of his, his ancestors, the Shema, God of Israel, the Lord our God is one. How can he affirm that and then believe that Jesus 
was also God because Jesus was worshipped. I mean, think, think about what a conflict that is for a Jew. A Jew, okay, you, you say Jesus died on the cross for my sins and, and I accept that he's the Messiah and we're going to sing about him, we're going to worship him, we're going to do all the things to him that we were doing to the God of Israel, but that's okay because it's not a violation of monotheism. Again, you, you, you sort of feel what they're up against. You know, intellectually, how, how do we do this? How do we parse this? I gave you a little homework last week, and here's where we'll start answering the question, how in the world could they, could they digest this? One of those passages was Genesis 19.24. Now, did anybody from last week figure out what's odd about this verse? And you read, it, you read like a Jewish translation, right? Now that's fascinating because both of them are the divine name. But you're, what you're telling me is your translation actually translates them differently, correct? Okay, that tells you right there that there's a tension. Because if you look at the verse, you have Yahweh twice. Yahweh rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire from Yahweh out of heaven. And so Ryan's translation actually reflects, well, we've got to do something, we've got to distinguish them, because it's just kind of freaky that we have Yahweh two times. Yahweh doing something, you know, sending something that came from Yahweh. It, the wording is just odd. And rabbinical writers, writers in the intertestamental period, noticed this. And this became part, I'm going to show you a lot of other passages tonight, this became part of their compulsion to somehow come up with this two powers in heaven idea so that they could deal with their Bible. They knew their Bible really well. Okay, they didn't miss this. They didn't miss the next one either. What's odd about this one? Everybody pick it out. Take a guess. It revolves around that fascinating subject of the use of person and number in grammar. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Okay, now watch. We begin with the first person. I have wrought destruction among you. And we know from the end of it that the speaker is Yahweh. So he says, you know, Yahweh says, I have wrought destruction among you, as when God, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You'll actually see this a number of times. Yahweh using both the first person and the third person. It just sounds odd. It sounds like there's some two thing going on but it's just kind of weird. Like, what do we do with that? Look at this one. I didn't give you this one last week. This is Abraham and Isaac's story. God tested Abraham and said to him, verse 2, take your son, offer him as a burnt offering. We get down to verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, don't, you know, don't hurt the child. For now, I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your only son from me. Okay, here's the highlighting. If you want to look at the coloring, look at the interchange. God speaking about himself, and then he speaks about himself as though he's somebody else. First person, third person interchange. Again, this is not that rare in the Old Testament. I'm just showing you a few examples. But again, rabbis know their text really well. And they see this going on. And so we got to do something with it. What is going on? This is a book, if you are interested in the subject, from a purely Jewish perspective. And I put this in here because if you do have Jewish friends, I told you last week, and especially tonight, 
if you're trying to do you know, evangelism, you're trying to get your Jewish friend to at least consider okay, Christian theology, Christianity, the, the, the claims of Jesus, the gospel, their big problems are this whole monotheism thing and then the, the status of Jesus as God. Well, if you want to just give them something they don't believe you. I don't believe that, that this used to be part of Jewish theology. This is the book right here. Now, it's an academic book. Two powers in heaven. Alan Siegel is a Jew. He just passed away last year. He was a Jew when he wrote it. He thinks the two powers idea is heretical. But he's a scholar, and he says, I know we used to believe this. And so he made it part of his life's work to chronicle the presence of Godhead thinking in Judaism, okay, prior to the second century AD. Other things. Now we're going to go through thematically, and I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to some biblical theological concepts that dovetail with this sort of tunis going on. So we looked at this weird interchange of person and number, but we're going to get more specific here. I think the easiest way to start is with the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, and then something referred to as the name. Now, if you're a Jew today, or if you know a Jew today, you do not, when you read your Hebrew Bible, when you come across the Tetragrammaton, the four consonant special name of God, Y-H-W-H, -H, you do not say, if you're really sort of conscious or strict about it, you do not say Yahweh you use a substitute. Often it is what was in Ryan's translation, Adonai. That's very common. The other option is Hashem, which is the name in Hebrew. Hashem, the name. Um, is it kind of interesting? I, I, I went through a, a Hebrew Bible program at Wisconsin, and all of our professors except one at the time was Jewish. And, and one of them insisted that we say Hashem. The other one didn't care. So it, it just depends on, on who you're, you're at. But this is still going on today. Let's look at some passages. Exodus 3, this is the burning bush. Who's in the bush is the question. Well, believe it or not, the angel is in the bush. The angel of Yahweh, an angel of Hashem, appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. This is Moses. And Moses says, wow, this is pretty spectacular. i got to go see what's going on. In verse 4, when Yahweh saw that he had turned aside. Now here's the question. Are there two or one? It looks like there's two there. And an even more subtle question is, if the writer cared about there being two in the same sacred presence in the bush, he could have distinguished them in some way to make sure the reader knew that one was up here and one was, you know. He could have done something, but he doesn't. He just lets it go. Exodus 23, this is a crucial passage. I am sending an angel. This is God speaking to Moses. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way They've just gone through the Red Sea. This is Exodus 23. We've got the law. Now we've got to get on the road. We've got to get on the way. We've got to make preparations to go to the land. I'm going to send an angel to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses. Right away, that's kind of unusual because I thought only God could pardon or not. Why won't he pardon your offenses since my name is in him? That's, that's just an odd thing to say. It's an odd thing to say to us. To them, a Jew reading this would know instantly that what this is saying is my presence, my essence, me, I'm in him. Okay. I'm, I'm going to do the angel thing so that you can see him. <laughs> All right? So I don't just like pop in and out and audible sounds. You're going to be able to see my presence leading you to the promised land. Deuteronomy 12, we get a lot of this language about the name. This is very common. I'm only going to show you one example. Basically, when they get into the land, God told Moses to tell Israel, look, 
don't worship the Lord your God in a manner like you know the pagans do. Look only to the site that the Lord your God will choose amidst all your tribes as his habitation to establish his name there. And when they get into the land, ultimately, what is going to be the place where God chooses to establish his name, his presence? Jerusalem. And specifically the temple. Now, it takes a while to get the temple, and we have the presence of God dwelling at other places. But even even before you have Jerusalem, the point was, you don't start making altars everywhere. Okay, I'm going to be one place, you know, with the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the whole bit. But ultimately, I'm going to choose a place to put my name. That's where I'm going to dwell. Now, the point is not, again, just, just to stress the point, God isn't telling Moses, now when, you, when you, you, know, you decide on this spot, or when I tell you what spot it is, I want you to you know, go there, and I want you to take out a real you know, indelible marker, make it a Sharpie and scratch Y-H-W-H on it, and we're cool. No, it has nothing to do with the consonants themselves. It's about the presence of God. Okay, he's not talking about spelling and about you know, the, the inscription itself. He's talking about his presence. Now, elsewhere, you get, again, this idea of the name just being another way to refer to Yahweh himself. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. It's very transparent there in Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. And again, I don't want to be silly, but I think I have to make the point. It's not like the Israelites are out there in battle and they see the army coming toward them, you know, ready to, you know, slaughter them. And they're going to say, oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to run out there and I'm going to write Y-H-W-H, cross over that well, you're going to get trampled, okay? Again, the point is not the consonants. It's not the name itself. It's the presence of God. Hashem, the name, is another way to refer to God himself. So if that's the case, when God says to Moses, you better listen to this angel, because my name is in him. Okay, that's me in human form. 2 Samuel 6 I like this one, too, because translations just do a number on this one. David gathered again all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. This is when they're going to move the ark. David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Yudah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called the name, the name of the Lord. Now, in Hebrew, you'll notice Shem occurs twice. And so the translation I have here is a good translation. But if you look at what the ESV does does with it, called by the name of the Lord of hosts, it really obscures the whole point. The point is that the ark itself was referred to as Hashem. Why would that be? Why would you look at the box, you know, with the cherubim on top, and look at it and say, Hashem, the name. Why would they do that? Because that's where God lived. Okay? I mean, you know, to put it that way, that's why they called the cherubim his throne. He who dwells between the cherubim. That's that, where he is. That's where his house is. That's where he lives. Where God lives, he is. You know, again, this idea that, that this object, the Ark of the Covenant, localized the presence of God. So it's very natural that they would look at it and say, Hashem, that's the spot right there. Again, it was associated with the presence of God. Sometimes the name gets described as a person. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar in blazing wrath. With a heavy burden, his lips full of fury, his tongue like devouring fire. Again, anthropomorphic language applied to not Yahweh in this case, but the name, who is Yahweh. Exodus 23, again, we come back here, again, to make the point, this idea that the name is in the angel is the Old Testament way of saying that this angel you're looking at is Yahweh, his essence, his presence, in visible human form. Now, we're going to look at 
some other in a moment. You know, we're we're going to really sort of twist your mind about this, but uh, let, let's. I want to hit this first in Deuteronomy four. This this passage here might not seem relevant to what we just said, but you have this one, Deuteronomy four, and then Exodus thirty three and Judges two. So we're going to take these in tandem. Exodus 23, we had a name in an angel. What was the angel's job? God says to Moses, I'm going to send an angel before you to what? To lead you to the promised land. Okay? But here, it's his own presence that takes them out of Egypt to the land. Here, it's my presence. Here, it's the angel. Well, which is it, Mike? You know, who led, you know, the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land? Was it Yahweh? Was it the angel? Was it his presence? The answer is yes. Hey, it's all of them, and they're all different, but they're the same. Genesis 31, a little bit more about the angel. Because even before Exodus 23, you get this figure, this angel, the, the Malach Adonai the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. This is Genesis 31. This is the part of the Jacob story when he's you know, going through the little kind of weird experiment about the uh, his flock with Laban. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spottled, and mottled. For I've seen all that Laban is doing you, to you. You know, Laban was cheating him. And look at what the angel says in verse 13. Now, the angel says this. I am the God of Bethel. Now, Bethel was where Jacob had met Yahweh earlier in his journey. And so when he has the angel you know, there in front of him, and he says, I'm the God of Bethel, to the reader, that should do something in your head. That should help you associate God with this particular angel. I am the God of Bethel. This is probably my... Well, I, lo I love Psalm 82, but next to Psalm 82, this, this might be my favorite verse in the Old Testament. It's just really cool. This is where Jacob is blessing the sons of Joseph. But Israel, Jacob, stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head. Remember, Joseph had uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. He puts his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger and his left hand on Manasseh's head, thus crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph, again, through his two sons, saying, now watch, look at what Jacob says. The God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. God there is Ha Elohim, the God. The God who has been my shepherd from my birth to this day. So you got an idea who he's talking about? Okay. <laughs> now he's going to throw you a curveball. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm. And here's the kicker. May he bless these lads. The verb in Hebrew is singular. It is not plural. You say, well, which one did he have in mind? Was it God or was it the angel? The answer is yes. Okay, the writer fuses the two characters because it's six of one and half a dozen of another. Okay? Is the angel is, but isn't Yahweh. He is Yahweh, he's because the essence is in this angel. But yet they're they're two different characters because they were both in the bush. Again, you get the feeling of this two and yet one, two and yet one, two and yet one. Sounds suspiciously like Christology, doesn't it? Okay, the way the New Testament writers are talking about Jesus and the Father. Judges 6. Now here you're going to see, you're going to see both characters in the same scene. Again. This is the Gideon narrative. An angel of Yahweh came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah. So remember, who's under the tree? The terebinth tree, that's the angel. Which belonged to Joash the Aviezrite. His son Gideon was then beating out wheat inside a wine press in order to keep it safe from the Midianites. 
the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you. So right away you have the angel referring to Yahweh, the third person. Okay, there's a distinction. Yahweh is with you, valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if Yahweh is with us, why are, you, why are we in this mess? Yahweh turned to him, which is real interesting language, and said, go in this might of yours. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yahweh turned, wait a minute, let's go back a slide. I thought the angel appeared to him. Well, wasn't, it, wasn't he talking to the angel and now Yahweh turns to him? Well, which is it, Mike? Is it the angel or is it Yahweh? Well, you know, it's, just take your pick, you know, because they're basically the same. They're the same, but they're different. So Yahweh turns to him and says, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. You know, I'm sending you. Go down to verse 16. Yahweh said to him, I'll be with you, so on and so forth. Then he, Gideon, said to him, we, we can't really tell there if he's talking to the angel or Yahweh. But he says, okay, if I've found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it's you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come and bring you out my present set up before you. And he said, again, we don't really know which one it is. He said, okay, I'll stay put until you get back. So Gideon goes and he makes his little present and he brings it to him under the terebinth tree. Okay, and who was at the tree? That was the angel. So that helps orient us a little bit. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and unleavened cakes, put them on the rock. And the angel of Yahweh reaches out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, touches the meat and the unleavened cakes, and you know, it, it, fire consumes it. And then the angel of Yahweh vanished from his sight. Okay, I, I got something else to do. Thanks for the, that little, little gift there. And isn't it interesting that it's the angel who accepts it? Okay. Thank you. I'm out of here, got another task to do. And then he, you know, Gideon kind of wakes up and says, well, boy, that was the angel of Yahweh. Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. You know, I'm scared. But Yahweh said to him, Yahweh's still there. Peace be to you, do not fear, you will not die. Okay, they're both there. One leaves, one comes. But, you know, you get these other parts where they're blurred. So there, again, there's this co-identification, but then there's this distinction. There's this two and, two and yet one, two and yet one, two and yet one idea. So to summarize to this point, the Hebrew Bible contains clear suggestions of a Godhead. That is Yahweh sort of as being two but yet one figure, two figures but yet one. And again, you, as, a, as, a, as a Jewish reader, as a Jewish writer and thinker, you're looking at your text going, okay, how do we like articulate this theologically? Because we got that Shema lurking around over in Deuteronomy 6. You know, you've got to take care of it. You've got to be careful here. But yet, this is in our Bible. You can't like just pretend it's not there. The name is another way of referring to Yahweh, as Jews do today. The name is within the angel. And the angel is therefore Yahweh in human form, at least visually, in some sense. So again, we've got this two, but yet one. Other items besides the angel. The word. This is not an exclusively New Testament concept. Because when I put the word up, I know what you're thinking. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, the word was with God, the word became flesh. Right. John got that somewhere. <laughs> okay. That just didn't pop into his head. He didn't get it from Greek philosophers and all this other stuff that you read in the academic literature. He gets it from his Old Testament. And, you know, and next week we'll, he, he had, there were some other Jews thinking the same thing that John you know, could, have, could have looked at too. Let's stick with the Old Testament now. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, I would suggest to you that visions are things that you see. Isn't that profound? Visions are things you see. Okay, I'm pointing it out because a lot of people, a lot of commentators, will go right by this in their commentary and start talking about Abraham hearing something in his head or just a voice. No, it was a vision. 
visions are things you see. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your reward will be very great. 1 Samuel 3. Again, we all know the story of Samuel, but do we? Do we really notice what's going on? Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord, to, to Yahweh under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And it's not just that not everybody had a Bible. You know, hey, that was basically like everybody didn't have a Bible. Right? You know, there was like one copy of this and it was with the Ark of the Covenant. So, you know, that would be the, the understatement of the year. It's not what it's talking about. It's, not, it's also not talking about, hey, it was really unusual for people to hear voices around them or in their heads. No, just like the last time, this is going to be something visual. Just watch. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Again, the, the text is very clear here. Now, Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord. Why? What does that mean? Because the word, there it is again, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Same word, you know, back in this, you know, eight, God revealed himself to Abram in a vision. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. Now, we know the story. You know, this is how it starts out. And Samuel hears this voice, and he doesn't know what to do. You know, he thinks it's Eli. So he gets up, and he runs over to Eli. You know, Here I am, and he, no, it's not me. And they, Eli finally figures it out and says, okay, if it happens again, you say, speak, Lord, for your, you know, I'm your servant. Your servant is here, I hear. So the Lord calls him again the third time. The Lord came and stood. Okay, again, this is the language of at least visibility or perhaps embodiment. The Lord stood. He didn't like float around in his head. Okay, he stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. And then he gets the bad news about Eli. You go down to the rest, to the end of the chapter, just look at what you read. Samuel grew... And the Lord, Yahweh, was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, which is where they were. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by or as the word of the Lord. And what this passage and the other one shows you is that the idea, the Old Testament has the idea of the word of God being visible, a visible person who was God. That's an Old Testament idea. Jeremiah 1, it even, Jeremiah 1 even ups the ante a little bit. He says, this is Jeremiah's call, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Then I said, ah, Lord God. He addresses the word as Yahweh Elohim. Adonai Elohim. No ambiguity here. The word is Yahweh. Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord, Yahweh, said to me, don't say I'm only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. Then the Lord, Yahweh, put out his hand. It's the language of embodiment. He puts out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I put my words in your mouth. The word of God, who is Yahweh, puts forth his hand and touches the prophet. Sounds suspiciously like divine embodiment, okay? Again, again, when the New Testament writers are thinking about what Jesus said and did, they parse it by stuff like this. Okay, they, they know the word became flesh. Well, yeah, well, he was flesh back here too, apparently. I mean, you could touch the, you know, people. And there are all sorts of passages that just sort of zoom into their minds that the Spirit uses for them to articulate the relationship between Jesus of Nazareth and the God of Israel. Okay, they're getting it from somewhere. Another one. This one's a little obscure, but
but it has a real impact, uh, especially at Jesus' trial, which I'll, I'll, just, I'll summarize it now, but I'll show it to you uh, next week. He who rides the clouds, some, some such language like that, the one who rides the clouds or rides through the heavens or something like that, this was a known title in the Old Testament world, the ancient Near Eastern world, for Baal. Baal, the enemy god. Now, I bring that up because nobody thought Baal was sort of a sub-level divine being. Baal was a big deal. Baal is everywhere. They couldn't, Israel couldn't go anywhere without running into Baal. The Baal cult lasted until the Roman period. It, it, it just, it was ubiquitous. Everybody knew who, who Baal was. This is a passage from Ugaritic literature where it has Baal called the charioteer of the clouds. Now, why do I bring this up? Because what the Old Testament writers did on occasion is they would say, okay, we got this Baal problem. We need to make a theological statement. We need to make a th put a theological land, a line in the sand, and say, look, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is the one to worship, not Baal. And one of the ways they would do that was they would take lines out of things like the Baal cycle, Ugaritic literature, Canaanite literature about Baal. They would lift it, put it into their, what they're doing in the Old Testament, and then they would change the name. Yahweh there to make the point. Baal was the, the, the god of, of uh, agriculture, the god of rain, the god that, that gave fresh crops, the god that kept you alive because you got to eat and it has to rain. And so the famous confrontation of Elijah with the prophets of Baal, okay, there's all sorts of punches in the nose against Baal in that narrative. And it has to do with who, you know, fire from heaven and all this kind of stuff. Who's going to bring rain and who's not? Okay, because there was a drought there. Well, one of the things they do is this title. Everybody knew that this was a, a known title of Baal. So on four or five occasions, the Old Testament writer takes it and says, no, Baal is not the one who rules the heavens, who rides through the heavens as though it's his turf. It's Yahweh who is the God of heaven, not Baal. And so here you have Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. Psalm 68. O kingdoms of, the, kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to Yahweh, to him who rides in the heavens. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, Yahweh, my God, you are very great, so on and so forth. He makes the clouds his chariot. Isaiah 19, behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt to judge. Now, here's why I bring this up. I'm going to show you one of the fundamental two powers passages in Judaism. Because everybody in the ancient world knew that he who rides in the clouds is a title of Baal. And they understood when it was applied to Yahweh what the message was. It's theological messaging. Yahweh is the God of heaven, not this divine flunky, okay? Not this underling, okay? We worship Yahweh, not this guy. Every time they use it of the God of Israel except one time. On one occasion, it's used of a second person, and that's Daniel 7. So Daniel writes, as I looked on, thrones were set in place. There's the plural, again, divine council idea from last week. Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. We know who that is. It's God enthroned. His garment was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like lamb's wool. His throne was tongues of flame. Its wheels were blazing fire. What does that sound like? Ezekiel chapter 1. Is there any doubt who's on that throne? Flame, the wheels, the whole bit. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 1, when Ezekiel sees the vision of God, the throne descended. A river of fire streamed forth before him. Thousands upon thousands served him. Myriads upon myriads attended him. The court sat, and the council sat, and the books were opened, 
And one like a human being came with the clouds of heaven. It's the only time you get that phrase of anyone else other than the God of Israel. Now, who is the Son of Man? Who is the human one who receives dominion and glory, the kingdom? Anybody know where this passage shows up in the New Testament? I mean, Siegel's a Jew saying, hey, you could easily look at this passage and see two. Ancient of days, the one who rides in the clouds, the human one. Anybody know where this passage is quoted in the New Testament? Okay, well, in case you can't come next week, I'll tell you. It's when Jesus, it's Matthew 26, when Jesus is standing in front of Caiaphas, the high priest, and Caiaphas has just had enough and says, look, quit beating around the bush. Tell us who you are. And so what does Jesus answer? To us, it looks like Jesus is just, you know, like has attention deficit disorder or something. Like he's not paying attention or just wants to be cryptic. Jesus quotes Daniel 7.13. He says, hereafter, you want to know who I am? Are you listening? Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds with great glory. Now we know Caiaphas instantly understood that he was claiming to be the second Yahweh figure because what does Caiaphas do? He tears his clothes and says, this is blasphemy. We have no more need of witnesses. He, Jesus just signs his own death, death certificate. Is that clear enough for you, Caiaphas? And he quotes this passage. And again, if you're a Jew, again, even before you get to the New Testament era, Daniel 7 became a pivotal, pivotal passage because, again, everybody knows who the Ancient of Days is, and everybody in the ancient world knew that the cloud rider was a title you applied only to a god, a legitimate deity figure. And when the biblical writers take it and, and apply it to Yahweh, everybody knows what's going on. But the one time they don't is Daniel 7. And the rabbis understood that there was a two-ness going on there. And so the new, comes around in the New Testament, Jesus essentially just gives it to both barrels, right in the face. Again, is that clear enough for you, Caiaphas? You really want to know? I'll tell you. You know, and he reacted, this is blasphemy. Now, if you have all that in your head, <laughs> which I know is a tall order, I want to show you a few hints of three. Okay, we've gone through that pretty rapidly. We've got the name, we've got the word, we've got this whole first, third person thing going on, all that stuff. Let me show you a couple passages in the Old Testament. Now, this is Isaiah 63, and we have the Lord, again, in all caps, it's the divine name, it's Yahweh, in verse 7. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, so on and so forth. And he begins to narrate the, the wilderness wanderings, that whole episode from Israel's history. He says in verse 9, or let's go to verse 8, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. Who? The Lord. The Lord became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. Well, no, wait a minute. I thought... In verse 8, I thought the Lord was the Savior, but now the angel of his presence is the one who saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up, carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And you say, well, I'm not quite sure there's a three distinction there. If you go to Psalm 78, here's the key to this. The, two, the key are the two terms, rebelled and grieved. Exactly the same Hebrew terms occur in this these two verses in Psalm 78. If you know Psalm 78, it's about the wilderness journey. Exactly the same context. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. 
So if you pardon the pun, if you triangulate <laughs> between Isaiah 63 and Psalm 78, you have God and the Holy One interchanged with the Holy Spirit. But God was already present in the narrative back up in verses 7 and 8. And oh, by the way, the angel's there too. Again, that's difficult to see. But if you compare the two passages describing the same event, you either get a writer that's really confused, or you get now you get sort of a three-in-one feeling. Here's another one from Ezekiel. Then I looked, and behold, a form that had the appearance of a man. Below what appeared to be his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming metal. Where have we heard that before in Ezekiel? Chapter 1. Remember Ezekiel sees the throne come down with the, the wheels within wheels and all that stuff. And there's a, a round throne platform. Underneath we have you know, the, the cherubim. And on top of the platform is the throne. And seated on the throne was one that looked like a man. And this is the description. Ezekiel 1. So we have the same divine Yahweh man thing going on here. He put out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of, the, of my head. So God grabs him by the lock of the head, but who lifts him up? The spirit. What are they taking turns? Are they taking turns yanking the ponytail? I mean, no. It's deliberately designed to get you to interchange the, the ideas, to interchange the persons. He put out the form of a hand, took me out of the lock of the head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the gateway, the inner court that faces north. So he has this vision of the temple. If you look at verse 5, then he, which one is he? It's, it's, it's one of those both and things. He said to me, son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north. And he starts showing him things. And in verse 6, the one speaking to him describes the temple as my sanctuary. Well, whose sanctuary was it in, the, in those other passages we just went through? It was the name. Who is Yahweh? Who is in the angel? Who now is somehow linked to the spirit, the God of Israel? Again, you, you look at it and you go, I, I wish they'd sort that out for me. I wish they'd tell me who's playing what role. And what I'm suggesting to you is in passages like this, they don't care. <laughs> if they wanted to, to distinguish all these things, or not distinguish, they would do it. But they leave the ambiguity there. And you get passages like this where the spirit is thrown into this divine language that elsewhere is used of too. And now you have the spirit thrown into the mix. And there are hints of this in the Old Testament. Now, Next week, I'm going to spend some time showing you how the interlocking ideas that produce the two and then bring the third along, how the New Testament writers use that to articulate the Trinity. Okay, they're, again, they're getting it from somewhere. So to wrap up, I would say take away, try to take away these points. The Hebrew Bible identifies another figure besides Yahweh with Yahweh's presence. That's an important idea. The second Yahweh figure is also distinguished from Yahweh. So again, two but yet one. One but yet two. The second Yahweh figure was frequently described in human form and at times even embodied the second Yahweh figure was but wasn't Yahweh. Just like Christians have to speak about Jesus. Listen to somebody pray sometime and how they interchange Jesus and God. It's just, it's, you just do it reflexively because it really doesn't matter. I don't have to be precise, do I? Well, no, not really. We, we kind of get it. They kind of got it. <laughs> they, they, get, they got it. First century Jewish writers speculated a lot about the identity of, of who number two was. We're going to talk about that next week. Because again, prior to a New Testament, prior to Jesus showing up, the Jews were not running around wondering what was in their Bible. They knew everything that I just showed you. 
and they were talking about it. How do we articulate this? How do we parse this? Who's number two? Who is this guy? You know, did, did God like take some some human he liked and and sort of glorify him to this level, or is it some some really important angel, or, or who is it? Okay, they had a lot of speculation. Of course, when Jesus comes around, the answer to the disciples is pretty easy. But we'll tell you who the second one is. That's an easy question. The harder question is, are you going to believe it? (laughs) Jews were therefore used to the idea of two and one before Christianity and could embrace the theology without, again, violating monotheism. And so one can't argue a Godhead idea was late or foreign. Like Christianity violates Judaism. It just doesn't. The second Yahweh was distinct from and superior to other Elohim. This is really important. If you single one out and identify that one with Yahweh, by definition, Yahweh and the second one are on an equal level. They are the same essence. Think of think of your Nicene Creed. Okay? They are of the same essence, but different figures, different persons. By definition, that means that any other Elohim that we talked about last week are not. Okay, that is a direct contradiction to things that like Mormonism would teach. Okay, Mormonism loves the idea of divine plurality. They don't like Trinitarianism. <laughs> you know, this is this mars what's going on in their theology and, and frankly you know, overturns it, frankly you know, confronts it. The term angel another one, does not of necessity rule out the Godhead. Oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses love this one. Jesus wasn't God. He was you know, he's this, this angel guy and blah, 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 blah. Big deal. Let me show you Genesis 48 where the angel and the God of Israel are fused together. Okay, I'm not moved by the word angel to think that you're correct. It has nothing to do with the issue. In fact, it's the foundation to two and one and three and one. Okay, but we're not, unless you're sort of on that wavelength, you're missing a good argument. And I'm not, I'm not saying go find a Jehovah's Witness to go argue it. But you're missing a, a good trajectory to have that discussion and just and, and just lay it you know, right where it belongs. And put, it, put it right in the line and say, look, go through all these passages. Now you tell me that this other one isn't Yahweh as well. Okay, that's your test. Prove to me he's not. If you can't do that, maybe you should be listening to me instead of the other way around. Yeah. Teaser for next time. If you were a Jew, I've already given you a little hint. Jews sort of thought in two categories. Angels and special people. (laughs) If you were a Jew, try to erase the New Testament from your mind. Who would you imagine? How would you imagine uh, what was going on with at at least the two? The the third one's the spirit. That's that's sort of easy. But how how would you imagine the other two persons of the Trinity without Jesus? How do you do that? Just try to to noodle that a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through a lot of Jewish texts and show you what they were thinking. Anyway, any questions? All right. If you were here last week or you watched the video from last week, I introduced the Old Testament idea of the two powers in heaven. Uh, Specifically, getting a little ahead of, of the Old Testament period, the two powers in heaven was a Jewish idea. It was part of Jewish theology. And that's significant because it's Judaism. Judaism is known for uh, its insistence on one God, one Yahweh, and not having a Godhead. If you were going to talk to a Jewish person today, they would not have any inkling of, of this thing that Christians refer to as a Godhead. But we looked at the fact that early in Judaism's history, they did have this idea, and it comes from the Old Testament. So we spent last week looking over that, and this week I want to take us through how 
not in the rabbinical period, you know, after the New Testament, but rabbis and Jewish thinkers from the time the Old Testament period ended to the time of the first century, how they thought about what we looked at last week, some of these odd passages that have a second Yahweh figure in them, along with Yahweh, the God of Israel. What did they do with that? So we'll look at what Jews did with it, and then we'll look at how Christians parsed it as well. Because that will give you a feeling for when it comes time to the first century, and some of this will overlap with the first century, with Jesus actually being here on earth, what the discussion was like. And I'm hoping that as we go through Jewish material and Christian material, you can see, hopefully you saw this a little bit last week, but you can see that for a Jew, they had this category in their head already, this idea of a Godhead. The real question was, who is that? And Christians, of course, are going to link all that we did last week to Jesus and say, look, you need to accept Jesus as Messiah, as God incarnate, as the second power. I mean, you, you, you've been thinking these thoughts for a few centuries at least. Your own writers have been writing about this stuff. You probably heard it in synagogue. And our claim is Jesus of Nazareth is this person. He came to earth, died on the cross, so on and so forth. So I'm hoping to get a little feel for that as we jump in. But by way of review, week one we asked or we sort of focused on one question. How do we present Jesus to Jewish people when they think Trinitarianism means polytheism? And we really looked at three answers to that. The Old Testament has its own concept of divine plurality, and in that plurality, Yahweh was unique in his essence and his attributes, exactly what what we think about in normal Christian theology. In principle, then, divine plurality is not a reason to reject Jesus as divine. That's a non-argument. Third, a Jew could come back and say, but Christians make Jesus equal to God. Surely that isn't Jewish. And the answer is, well, yeah, it really is, because that's what we looked at last week. So by way of review from last week, we talked about the name Hashem in Hebrew, which is another way that the Old Testament and modern Jews still use, still do this. The way that the Old Testament refers to Yahweh without using the YHWH. Hashem, the name, is just another way of saying Yahweh. So we looked at that. We saw that there was one particular angel that in Exodus 23, the text says, God tells Moses, my name, it was my essence, my presence is in that angel and you're supposed to obey him. So we saw that if you actually look at the narratives about leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land, you'll see credited with the deliverance from Egypt and bringing the Israelites into the Promised Land, you'll see verses that say God did it, Yahweh did it. You'll see verses that say the angel did it, and you'll see verses that say my presence did it. And I said, well, who did it? The answer is yes. Okay, they're all, you know, it, it's, it's all essentially the same essence, the same godness, if you will. But the fact that the angel in other passages is clearly distinct from Yahweh, and in other passages he, he is Yahweh, other passages he isn't, you get this feeling of two-ness. Two but yet one, one but yet two. And again, this is the conceptual backdrop for how the New Testament treats Jesus, how the New Testament writers talk about Jesus. We also looked at the word. Since the angel had a human form and had Yahweh in him, was essentially Yahweh embodied, or at least made visual as a man, we saw that in some cases the phrase, the word of the Lord, described the very same thing. We went to Genesis 15, we talked about 1 Samuel 3, Jeremiah 1 is a really sort of palpable example where Jeremiah says the word of the Lord came to me and he calls the word of the Lord Yahweh, he uses Yahweh several times of that figure, that being, and around verse 9 it says the word of the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth. So we even have a tactile thing going on in that passage. And lastly, we looked at the cloud rider, the one who comes with the clouds, the one who comes upon the clouds, or the one who rides the clouds. 
we made the comment that this was an important passage to Jews in regard to the two Yahweh's idea because they knew that this idea of riding the clouds was a known title of deity in the ancient world. Specifically, most familiar to them would be Baal. But it was often used five or six times in the Old Testament to describe Yahweh. Again, it was a theological statement. Baal isn't the Lord of the heavens, the one who rides the clouds. Yahweh is. Except for one verse, and that was Daniel 7.13. There was a second person that gets described with that phrase, a very important phrase. And so, again, Jewish thinkers looked at that and they thought, well, that's just kind of odd. You know, why, <clears throat> why would it be so consistent until you get to this Daniel 7? And lo and behold, the cloud rider in Daniel 7 is in the same scene as the Ancient of Days, the God on his throne. But to boot, he's human life. He's the son of man. He's the human one. So we went through all of that, and we ended up with the thought that, you know, if you were a Jew, you're used to thinking of this two but one, one but two. And number two is like human in form, human in appearance. Again, this sets up what the New Testament writers are going to be saying about Jesus. And we want to jump into that tonight. But first, I want to show you what Jews did with it. Prior to Jesus coming, uh, during the first century, uh, when they were arguing you know, with the apostles and so on and so forth, up to the second century A.D., there was a big discussion going on within Judaism. After the second century, again, not coincidentally, in the wake of the rise of Christianity, uh, after that point, they had to declare it a heresy because they could not, they were losing converts to the early church. Okay. Jews, they were the first converts to, to follow Jesus. Jews were telling their friends and neighbors and family, look, you know, we're, we've been talking about this for, for centuries. Our teachers have been showing us this. And now, you know, we heard the apostles preach about Jesus of Nazareth, and he performed miracles, and they performed miracles, and, you know, he, he fulfilled all these prophecies. I mean, it, to them, the pieces were just falling together in their head. And so the Jewish community declared it a heresy at that time. Prior to that, there were a number of ideas, and I'm, I'm going to run through these quickly because they're kind of interesting. Some of them are funny. Uh, some of them are just like, you got to be kidding. But no, they really thought this. There was one category of exalted humans. So some Jews, their camp was, okay, the second power is probably some human person that after they died, or even in some cases, this is going to sound really weird, even before they died, they pre-existed and they were God's helper. Now, Adam, you'll actually find texts. This is the book of Second Enoch, where Adam becomes a candidate. We have here, and on earth I assigned him, this is God speaking, to be a second angel, honored and great and glorious, and I assigned him to be a king. You know, that kind of makes sense. Adam was ruling the earth, so we'll call him a king. I assigned him to be a king to reign on the earth and have to have my wisdom. There was nothing comparable to him on the earth, even among my creatures that exist. So in other texts, Adam becomes the greatest thing in creation and rules all the other stuff. And so to some Jews, he became a logical candidate to be God's helper. Okay, this is the second guy, the second person of this relationship. And when he died... Uh, he was thought to be an angel. Now, if, I know this sounds weird, but think about it. How many times have you seen on TV or commercials or cartoons or movies, when somebody dies, they become a, an angel? I mean, we, we have this idea. And you, Have you ever asked yourself, where does that come from? I mean, do you, do you like, really read that in the New Testament somewhere? Uh, you know, we, we just sort of have this idea that we, we go to the divine realm and we get wings and we play harps and, you know, we, we do what God asks us to do. They're thinking the same sort of things here, but with Adam, Adam was the crowning point of creation, so there must be something special about him. So some people had, you know, were fans of Adam as far as the second one. You'll notice he's seated on a golden throne, has a terrifying appearance. So some, some Jews were actually, like, making it dramatic. Writing about, you know, this Adam must have this position, the first form man, first form Adam. 
So Adam had his fans, Jacob had his fans, because Jacob was Israel. He was important in the Old Testament. Something called the prayer of Joseph. We have sort of the deification of Jacob into an angel called Israel. Now, in the first week, I went by this with lightning speed, but the Old Testament has this idea that the nations of the, of the earth were divided and they were put under the authority of the sons of God, okay, divine beings. Uh, that was very much part of Jewish theology, and it leaks out here because they're saying, well, who, who would be, who is the logical patron angel of Israel? There isn't one in the Old Testament. It must be Jacob. When he died, he was Israel on earth, and when he goes to heaven, he's Israel up there. And he must be the most important one because those are God's people. You see, they're, they're just doing logical extrapolation. And whether it makes sense or not, this is what they're thinking. In a lot of cases, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But some, sometimes it does in a weird sort of way. So this, again, these are Jewish texts. I mean, you look at what they're, they're saying. I'm, is, I'm speaking to you. I'm also Israel, an angel of God and a ruling spirit. Here down here, he's an archangel of the power of the Lord, the chief captain among the sons of God. So he must be number two in heaven. So Jacob had his fans. Enoch, again, why would Enoch have his fans? Because Enoch never died. Well, that's different. Okay, so Enoch must be doing something in the spiritual world. He's not, like, retired. So what would, it, what would his job be? Well, again, some people thought, well, Enoch's job is probably this number two Yahweh guy. He's God's biggest helper. Okay. So you had Enoch uh, being part of this, and this is from the book of First Enoch, uh, which is a, a book composed between the Testaments. And here again you get this idea where Enoch is transformed. My whole body mollified, my spirit transformed. Enoch is called the son of man, okay, just like Daniel 7. So some Jews stuck that title to him because they thought he was the best candidate. Continuing in second Enoch, we have, let Enoch join in and stand in front of my face, my presence forever. Put him into clothes of my glory. I looked at myself, Enoch says, and I had become like one of the glorious ones. So he's like transformed into this divine being thing. Okay. Some, some Jews were saying, Enoch must be the guy. Moses gets his votes. This is kind of a shocking text, but... Again, we're, we're used to thinking of Moses in association with the law, right? It's a normal association, and to the Jew, the law was like it. This is the, the central focus of their faith. So Moses, of course, has a special place in the hearts and minds of many Jews. We read here that on Sinai's peak, I, Moses, saw what seemed a throne. Now, we read that in Exodus 24, where Moses and Aaron... Nadav and Avihu and 70 other elders get to see the God of Israel. But we're getting another account here. Upon it sat a man of noble mien, be crowned with a scepter in one hand. I made approach and stood before the throne. So Moses gets a little brave here and says, I'm, I'm going to see how close I can get. <laughs> so he starts moving up. He handed over the scepter and bade me mount the throne and gave me the crown. I have a seat for a while, Moses. I mean, that's just, that's just kind of shocking for a Jew to write something like that, especially with Moses. It gives you a little idea what Paul was dealing with. There were some people who were really devoted to the law. Now, others said, no, you guys have it all wrong. It has nothing to do with an exalted, glorified human. It must be, number two must be someone who is already an angel, but just sort of kind of like wins the job. Michael is sort of the obvious candidate. Michael was considered by some writers to be Yahweh's co-regent in heaven. We sort of get a little feel for that in Daniel 12 because Michael is, the, is sort of the patron angel in Daniel chapter 12 of Israel. Okay, you say, well, how come they picked other people? Don't try to make it logical in your head. Right? They're just trying to, they're trying to root for their guy. So you have this sort of feel here. And so because of Daniel 12, a lot of Jews thought, well, it just has to be Michael. Michael is, 
is just it. You know, this is the one that's sort of closest to what we see in the Old Testament. It must be him. Michael was identified as the angel of Yahweh, not in the Old Testament, but in something called the Targums. Anybody know what the Targums are? The tar a Targum, a Targum, is the translation of the Bible, in this case, the Old Testament. But you'll get them with the New as well. Translation of the Bible into Aramaic. Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So Aramaic is a related but different language. And so when it was translated into Aramaic, the name for that was a targum. So targums are plural. There's lots of translations into Aramaic of the Old Testament and the New. There are New Testament targums as well. So in the targums, the translator, whoever did that work, felt justified or, you know, maybe he just was a Michael fan, but in some passages, he actually inserts the name Michael to identify the angel of the Lord. He just does it. That was his opinion, so that it works its way into the translation. Testament of Daniel, or Dan, excuse me, we have here, draw near to God, to the angel who intercedes for you. So Michael was viewed as a personal intercessor. Kind of, this is an this isn't a really good example, but I'll use it. It might be familiar. Sort of the way Mary is sort of a, a, has a mediatorial role in Roman Catholicism. Well, to many Jews, Michael had a role like that. Where you could, he would intercede for you on, be, on your behalf to God. There's a book called Joseph and, and Asenath. That was his wife, uh, according to the Old Testament, the Egyptian where we read a little bit about Michael, chief of the house of the Lord, and so on and so forth, commander of the host of the Most High. Now, the book of Daniel doesn't actually... The book of Daniel says that. It, it, Daniel's a little... It's a little hard to figure out who the... Are the prince of the host and, you know, the highest of the princes, are they the same guy or are they different? But in this text, they're identified with Michael. Others had this angel. Now, you won't read this angel's name in the Old Testament or anywhere in the Bible. Look at the name. What strikes you about the name? This is the name of an angel. El is God and so is Yah. Yah is the short form of Yahweh. Yah shows up in the Old Testament you know, a few dozen times. So, a Jew... Whoever wrote this, we don't know who wrote the Apocalypse of Abraham, but whoever did, took two names of God and gave them to an angel and didn't feel like he was blaspheming when he did it. Okay, just, I don't like any of these candidates for the second power, so I'm just going to make pick an angel and name him Yah El or Yaho El. The same deified figure appears in the life of Adam and Eve. Again, this is another book, it's another Jewish book written between the Testaments that didn't make it you know, into the Old Testament. In this case, God himself is called Yael. So we have texts where God is Yael. That makes sense because those are his names. But then there's an angel that gets those names. So right away, you're confronted again. These are Jews. These are the you know, super-duper monotheistic Jews, militant monotheistic Jews, taking a name of God and giving it to a second person. And it, it shows you that that was acceptable to them. They're, they're trying to sort of articulate how they think this works. Here we have Yah, Yahoel again. Go, Yael, the same name to the mediation of my ineffable name. Here we have clearly, again, a second character, distinct from Michael, because Michael, you know, he says, and with me, Michael blesses you forever. So this Jew, again, whoever wrote this text, did not think the second power was Michael. It was this other angel that he created and gave this name. This one you may have heard of, Philo, was probably the most important Jewish writer of his era. Uh, if you're familiar with two non-biblical Jewish writers, it's, they're probably Philo and Josephus. 
And Josephus is a little later, he was a historian. Philo is a philosopher and a theologian. Uh, he, he writes religious theological stuff. And Philo used this term, Philo wrote in Greek, he used the term logos to apply to number two. Isn't that interesting? Because who else that we know does that? John. <laughs> so you have this, again, this overlap because Philo knows that back in his Old Testament, there's this word of the Lord character. And in Greek, word of the Lord, that's logos. So he picks up on that and tries to write a full-blown theology of, of a Godhead, of, of how what's the relationship between God and this other figure. Now Philo, his theology is not the same as John's because for Philo, the Logos was a created being. He's, he's created in some passages, in other passages he's not. But Philo really tries to say he's he's God, but he's not like 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 really I mean, he's God, but he struggles. You know. He's God, but he isn't. He isn't. Just call him the Logos. And you know. <laughs> now the problem is. He gets a little tongue-tied here. He actually refers to the Logos as the mighty Logos, who is my viceroy. The Logos is that power of God by which he made all things. That is New Testament theology there. Because it's Jesus, the word, by whom all things were and all things consist. We have here, God is indeed one. He's a Jew, he's got to affirm that. His highest and chief powers are two, even goodness and sovereignty. In the midst between the two, there's a third which unites them, the Logos. For it is through the Logos that God is both ruler and good. So the Logos is sort of the conduit through which God does things. Yeah, it's difficult. Philo gets this dramatic. He refers to the Logos as the second God. The Deuteros Theos. He actually uses a second God in his commentary on Genesis here. So for a Jew, and this was not considered heretical, for a Jew to use a phrase like second God was pretty dramatic. But they're trying to figure out how to talk about this. Memra. Word of the Lord, the word for word in Greek is logos. The word for word in Aramaic is memra. There are lots of Jewish writers who wrote about the memra because they were writing in Aramaic. That was, the, that was the word they had to use. So memra is the Aramaic word for word. It occurs widely in the Targums. Remember, the Targums are Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. And when they're doing translations, they let their theology fly. <laughs> uh, they are putting the memra into all sorts of interesting scenes. Some passages that we looked at last week where you get this feeling that there's two persons. I'll show you a few in a, in a moment here. So we have memra. So the memra is the logos. The logos is the Greek word. Greek word. Memra is Aramaic. So Memra is, again, God's word as though he were a person. And I clipped some of these from a, an article on this. But just look at some of these examples. Th these are Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. Now, here's, here's the kicker. That would have been used, they would have been current when Jesus was here on earth. If you couldn't read Greek and you couldn't read Hebrew, this is what you read. You're reading Aramaic because it was your native language. And they're getting two powers, you know, they're getting you know, both barrels of it. Because here we have Genesis 3, 9, the Lord God called unto, unto man, unto Adam. Well, in the Targum, the Jerusalem Targum, it says, the memra of the Lord God called to the man. It's not God, it's the memra. Now, if you think back to Genesis 3, what in Genesis 3 might give you the feel that God has a body there. Remember back to the passage? Walked through the garden, and Adam, Adam heard the sound of God walking through the garden. And the 
rule of the day. So whoever did this translation, when they got to the, the, that passage, their visual, well, what would that look like? It must have been God in a body or something walking around. And so the best way to convey that is to use memory. Second character. Genesis 20 with Abimelech. It isn't God who comes to Abimelech in a dream. It's the Memra. Now, what's another interesting one here? Uh, the, let's see. The Lord said to Moses, the Memra of the Lord said to Moses. They're getting this from the, these word of the Lord passages. So when God starts talking in certain passages, since, I'll catch this, since in passages like Genesis 15 and 1 Samuel 3 and Jeremiah 1, since in those passages the word passages the word of the Lord turns out to be like a person, it seems reasonable to the Jewish translator that that's what's going on. So we're going to put it in there to convey that idea. It's it's highly interpretive, but you see where they're getting. This is the way it was in Genesis 15. And so on. Probably going on here too. Oh, Genesis 3:8. They heard the voice right there is the passage, so on and so forth. But you, you get the idea. This is, again, the Aramaic Bible that the disciples would have known. We don't know what they read, when they read it. But I'm pointing this out to say, look, this idea of two yet one, one yet two, this is not news to them. This is not news. What's news is the fact that number two in Christian theology is incarnated. It's traveled through the woman's birth canal. Okay, that's new. <laughs> that's a little that, that's a little freaky right there. Uh, another one with Memra, Genesis 1:27. The Memra created man in his own image. Well, that makes sense because we have like physical bodies. So, you know, you know if you've if you've ever read anything about the image of God. One of the views or one of the questions it's asked, well, does image possibly mean like we look like God? You know, well, we can't because God doesn't have a body. Well, that's right. But the second power had a body. So that's where he's born, right there. And you see what they're thinking when they're doing this. Another one. Again, we're doing this rapidly. There's a lot to cover. The Shekinah or Shekin Ka, these are, these are both Aramaic, but well, one's Hebrew, one's Aramaic. Shekinah is probably the way you've heard that pronounced, if you've heard the word at all. This is another sort of figure, another term that refers to this embodied deity person. It comes from Shekan, which means to dwell. And the verb is used in the Old Testament phrase when God starts talking about the tabernacle and the temple, he says, he refers to it as the place where I will cause my name, Hashem, to dwell. The place where I will put my name. So Shukan is to dwell. And so the whatever filled the temple, <laughs> whatever showed up or whatever was imagined to be in the cloud that was speaking to Moses, to some Jews, they use the term Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. It's a reference to God's glory dwelling in that place. So it was, it was God's glory sort of put into form. And their word for that was the Shekinah, or in Aramaic, the Shekinah. Shekinah, by the way, was used of not only the second Yahweh, but there are Jewish writings that use that term to refer to the spirit as well. So I want you to catch the importance of that. I, I know a lot of the material is foreign, but think about this. You have Jews running around in the first century who are using words like memra and shekinah or shekinah to refer to this, to God in form, in human form or something physical. And they're using the term not just of number two, but of number three. There were Jews thinking of a tripartite Godhead before Jesus ever showed up. OK? 
okay? And they have these categories. They have the conceptual categories. At least things like this are being discussed. Things like this show up in their translations so that when the apostles come along, when Paul comes along, when he starts talking about the deity of Christ and in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily and all this stuff we read in the New Testament, they're not like getting whiplash thinking this guy's crazy. You know, what, what's he talking about? They're at, they actually have something to think about. That confronts them with something. Do I believe that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, filled this role? Do I believe that? They had to make a decision. They had to make a choice. It was a theological question. So just a few examples. Uh, we have here, I will cause my Shekinah, my Shekinka, to dwell in the midst of the children of Israel. Again, it was, it was the glory cloud or the glory presence in some form. Again, the Targums, those translations. God walking among his people, sometimes they'll use Shekin Ka instead of Memra. Sometimes they're interchangeable. This is the, the scene where God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and it passes in front of him. In the Targums, that the, the person that passes in front of him is the Shekin Ka. It's the glory of God in some sort of discernible form. Now, when Christians come along, if you're a theologian, if you're like, I mean, Paul knows all this stuff. You know, it, it's, it's hard to know how much somebody like John or some of the other disciples would have known. Paul certainly, you know, he, he could have written the books on it because he was highly educated uh, in, you know, for his time. He had the best of training. But the other disciples, you know, would have picked up bits and pieces of it from their teachers, their rabbis, things they read, translations like the Targums. So when Jesus comes along, in the New Testament, you get the first thing they're confronted with is the Messiah issue. And once they get over the, the Messiah issue hump, once they realize that, you know, I've been called by the Messiah, and we've been walking around here for a few months we're watching him do these things. Surely, you know, this is the anointed one. Okay, Peter, you are the Christ. You're the anointed one. Later on, when they start writing and preaching after the resurrection, they have to start putting things down on paper, as it were. They're going to be drawing on a lot of this stuff. A lot of these pieces are going to be falling into place for them. And especially Paul, because Paul is so thoroughly conversant with a lot of it. So in basic terms, just the New Testament is where we're going to part tonight. What did New Testament writers do with some of the Old Testament ideas? Well, the most obvious one for us is the Word. We've talked about this already. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. If you were a Jew who couldn't read Greek and someone was kind enough to put this into Aramaic, it would read, in the beginning was the Memra. And the Memra was with God, the Memra was God. Well, that makes sense, but I got, I got my Old Testament here in Aramaic and it says that too. Oh, that's easy. And it, they, they could understand it very clearly. Word became flesh, and no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Which, again, just look at the verse. Only God. Oh, and by the way, beside that only God, there's this one. <laughs> you, know, you just look at the wording, and it's just telegraphed there. The angel, this is a curious passage. Jude 5. Jude writes, now I want to remind you, Although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Where do we read about Jesus saving anybody in the Old Testament? Where do we read that? What's Jude thinking? Who did 
save the people out of the land of Egypt. Yahweh, the angel, and the presence. Jude says, let's add Jesus. <laughs> you know, to him, this is like, well, duh. Of course it was Jesus, because Jesus is now the incarnation of Yahweh. Whereas before, there was embodiment, but it was an incarnation. But it, you know, it's six of one and a half dozen of another. Same thing going on, just different times. We have Exodus 23, very specifically here. God sends the angel, my name is in him. Judges 2. The name. This is kind of interesting. We've read John 17 a lot because it's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Think about what, what Jesus is saying. He says to God, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your life. Is there a Jew alive? Was there a Jew alive in the first century that did not know what God's name was? How could you be a Jew? at any time in history and not know that your God's name was Yahweh. I am. The Shema, if you knew one verse, the creed of Israel, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord our God is one. Jesus isn't saying, hey, I, thank you, Father, I came to inform everyone what your name was. It was a tough job. Like nobody knew that. He's not telling them what God's name is. What he's doing is he's manifesting your name. He that has seen me, finish the verse, has seen the Father. While I was with them, I kept them in or by your name which you have given me. So like when they were in trouble, Jesus said, hold on, guys. Y-H-W-H. It's absurd. Kept them by your name means I was able to keep them by your power. Why? Because I'm you in a body. I made known to them your name. Again, Jesus didn't come and say, hey, Fellows, before I leave town, I just want you to know. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? But it's easy because of this word, N-A-M-E, name. We sort of, we either sort of gloss over it or Jesus is being cryptic here. I don't know. I'll, ask, I'll go ask Pastor Pat Williams or something like that. Because it just sounds odd. You know, and that's normal. But if you think in the Old Testament, the name is another way to refer to Yahweh himself. And that the name sometimes is, is embodied. Then you got something else going on here. Rider on the clouds. I actually alluded to this one last week. We'll hit it again. This is Daniel 7.13, where Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, upon the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, a human one, a bar and osh. This is what it is in Aramaic. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So we talked again last week about how this title is always used of Yahweh except for this verse. And if you weren't here last time, here is where it's used. This is when Jesus is standing before Caiaphas, the high priest, who's on trial. This is high stakes. It's life or death. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? You know, Jesus is getting accused by some worthless people. What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So Jesus said, paraphrasing, I want an answer. Are you listening? <laughs> I'm going to give you one. And he says, I tell you, 
from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He quotes Daniel 7.13. That's my answer. And Caiaphas knows instantly what he's saying. He knows he's just made himself to be the second Yahweh guy, the cloud writer in Daniel 7, because the high priest tears his robes. That's a symbol in the Old Testament everywhere for, I am really torqued. <laughs> or, this is just awful, an awful circumstance, and says he has uttered blasphemy. Lord, I just said I was human. What are you mad at? No, Jesus knows what he's doing. Here you go, Mr. High Priest. Is it clear enough now? And that's pretty much the end of the trial. Now, hit a few points here because I'm, I'm going to tack on something uh, that is probably worth going into at this point. But to this point, New Testament writers, again, repurpose Old Testament theology. They repurpose Old Testament phrases and words that describe Yahweh in human form. And they're going to use these things of Jesus. Here's the question. Why would they do that if they didn't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh? It's precisely why they did do it. So by identifying Jesus with the second Yahweh, they make this point. Therefore, and here's something that you can take to your Jehovah's Witness friend or your Mormon friend. Since they're doing this, this tells you automatically that they're linking Jesus, not with just an angel or any angel or any of the other Elohim or any of this stuff. They're linking him specifically with the angel who is Yahweh. Not any other ones, that one. And they're doing that because they're drawing an equation. He is not, Jesus is not a lesser divine being than Yahweh. He is Yahweh in, again, human flesh. Hebrews 2 makes that point. To which of the angels does God say this or do this or that? The whole chapter is contrasting Jesus and angels. Jesus is better. He's superior. Now, a quick excursus before we wrap up tonight. There's one other figure in the Old Testament that relates to the question of a Jewish godhead. And that is the figure of wisdom. If you're not familiar with wisdom, specifically, this character is the backdrop to Jesus as the co-creator. Because okay, Paul and John, a little bit with the word, but especially this one, Paul and John have Jesus as being present at creation and being God's instrument to create everything else. Okay? In the Old Testament, that is never said of the angel. It's never said of the word. It is said of wisdom. So we need to cover this character. Proverbs 8 is where you get it. Now, in verse 1, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way at the crossroads, she takes her stand. If you read through the whole chapter, Proverbs chapter 1, a couple other chapters, wisdom is cast as a person, but specifically a woman. Why is that? Some of you have heard me lecture on this before. I'll try to be mercifully brief. The reason that wisdom is a woman is because the Hebrew word for wisdom is chokmah, which is grammatically feminine. If you've studied foreign language, Spanish, German, French, whatever, you know that nouns are classified by gender. It's completely arbitrary. For instance, in German, das Mädchen, little girl, is neuter. Okay? <laughs> Why? I don't know. 
Okay. Gender is a means that language uses to classify nouns so that they can match them up with verbs. And you know what we talked about. The English doesn't use endings to identify these things. So if you don't have a foreign language, you probably never heard of this. But Hebrew is like lots of other languages. It uses gender to classify nouns. And chokma is feminine. That's why the pronouns her and she show up in the text, because it's proper. It's literarily proper. It has nothing to do with biological gender. But we get here, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. We'll come back to this verse. Ages ago, I was set up. Wisdom is talking about herself. Before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills. Before this. Before that. You know, I was brought forth. So you get the idea that wisdom is around. Let's just go back. Wisdom is around at the beginning. At the very beginning. So God has somebody there. A helper or whatever. Co-creator. In the Old Testament. Now, who is wisdom? Well, there are a lot of books. Wisdom of Solomon is one. Again, Jewish writers are writing between the Testaments, and they're commenting on Proverbs 8. So they say a lot of interesting things about this character. I tell you what wisdom is and how she came to be, and I will hide no secrets from you. I will trace her course from the beginning of creation, blah, 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 blah. They're getting that then from Proverbs 8. For wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. She is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Key passage here. I'll come back to this. She is a reflection. The Greek word is apogosma, of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God. An image of his goodness. He likes her. <laughs> By your wisdom, you have formed humankind. Give me wisdom that sits by your throne. And we get this throne language again. And these are Jews. These are Jews writing this stuff. With you is wisdom. She knows your works and was present when you made the world. Well, he's getting that from Proverbs 8. Send her forth from the holy heavens and from the throne of your glory. Send her. She must have a nice seat up in heaven, so these kind of wordings. Another book, Sirach. In the assembly of the Most High, there's the divine council from week one. She opens her mouth. I dwelt in the highest heavens. My throne was in a pillar of cloud. Now, wait a minute. Who was in the pillar of cloud in the Old Testament? That would be God. <laughs> and here we have wisdom in the pillar. And you, you get this sort of Godhead flavor again. The New Testament writers do interesting things with this. This is one that's hard to find, but it's, it's, a, it's a little dramatic. In Luke 11, Jesus is speaking. And he's railing against the scribes and Pharisees again, like he often did. Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves don't touch the burden with one of your fingers. So he starts going off on them. You build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. Your witnesses and consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them. You build their tombs. And he, he quotes something. Therefore also, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. So Jesus is saying that the wisdom of God said, thus and so. This puts the wisdom of God in the role of God. As we read in Ephesians 4 and other places, that God sent prophets and apostles and all that stuff. So that's odd. Jesus is sort of linking wisdom to God. But Matthew one-ups that. Same passage, same scene, Jesus is speaking, and look at, look at what changes. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. Matthew puts Jesus in the role of wisdom, who was in the role of God. 
they're mixing and matching. It's a Godhead. These are Jews quoting Jewish texts. One of them is your Old Testament. Identifying Jesus with this other figure who is but isn't God. We looked at this verse. This is my favorite one, my favorite wisdom thing, because this is, you know, for a text geek like me, this is dramatic. We read, wisdom is a reflection, apagasma of eternal light, spotless mirror, the working of God. Guess where this gets quoted in the New Testament? Let me, let me just prep it by saying this. This word is really rare. It occurs one time in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is the verse. It only occurs two or three times in the entire Greek literary world. Okay. It's really rare. So when the New Testament writer quotes it, he's getting it from here because this is going to be reflected around it. So it's a reference to wisdom. Anybody know? Anybody have an inkling where this is quoted? Let's see if you can sort of pick it out of the out of the ether. Radiance, reflection, image of God. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. You know what it is yet? It's Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. Who was that? Hebrews, <laughs> Jews. <laughs> Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Again, wisdom is the, has been that character in, in the in intertestamental period. But it's no, it's through Jesus, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance the apostasma of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He quotes that passage. It's an extremely rare term. You know, if I guess when I'm in a... I, I, don't, want, I don't want to come off as a monster here. There are some times that I've done in the, this in the past, and I'm not saying this is the right thing, Usually when I get a Jehovah's Witness you know, in my past, it's like, please don't come again. You're not gonna you're not gonna get me, blah 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 blah. But I have done things like this to them. <laughs> Where I'll say, Well, you're gonna talk to me about the Greek and about angels? Let's take a look. Okay, do the math. Because there is no other thing that this could possibly refer to but the second person of the Godhead. In Judaism. If you've ever dealt with a Jehovah's Witness, you know how much they love the Old Testament. That's really where they want to go. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the writer of Hebrews could have done to make it, make it any more powerful. So that when you get to Colossians 1, by him were all things created, heaven and earth, visible and invisible. 1 Corinthians 8. There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Okay, you know, you get this. This is where they get the theology of Jesus as co-creator. Here's the point. The idea that Jesus is God in the flesh and the co-creator of humanity and everything that is, is Jewish. This is not a New Testament invention. It's a Jewish concept that God had a co-creator, an agent of creation. And the New Testament writers take Jewish stuff, Old Testament and even books in between that aren't in our Bibles. They even go that far to make the point. Now this is the prickly part. If you like church history, you probably have come across this passage. Because you say, well, you know, if Jesus is this character, what do we do with verse 22? The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. The verb here is kana in Hebrew. 
It is used elsewhere for create. And the Jehovah's Witnesses love this. See, I told you Jesus was created. Well, that's picking and choosing the lexicon because the verb is not always used that way. It's used for create in Genesis 14. It's used to acquire, possess, Genesis 33. It's used to produce or bring forth in Genesis 4. I like Genesis 4. I think it's instructive. Genesis 4.1 is when Eve gives birth to my chronology right here. She, she gives birth to, uh, I think it's Cain. Yeah, Cain's the second one. She says, I have gotten a man. I have kana a man with the help of the Lord. Now here's the question. Did an Old Testament person, Eve, any, anybody else in the Old Testament, any woman, did they believe that, that when she gave birth, that was the moment where that thing that she just birthed came into existence? No, because it's moving around. I mean, even though they don't have you know, modern, the conveniences of modern science, they know that there is a life inside them. And when they bring it forth, it's, it's, a, it's giving birth. It's not when the thing begins to be alive. It's been alive before that. So it pre-existed the bringing forth. This is the way the church fathers argued Proverbs 8. Remember when they wrote the Nicene Creed? The whole thing about Jesus being begotten and not created. If you've ever read the Nicene? This is really important because they're trying to argue that Jesus is not created. They're trying to be consistent. They're saying, look, just because this verb is there does not mean that that's when he had the beginning of his existence. He existed prior to this, and God brought him forth. Okay, that was, we don't use words like begotten, but that's what it meant. It meant to bring forth as opposed to this is when it starts living. If you look at the creed, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. One Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father. The only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. That language is deliberate. It is important because of this, this issue up here. I think this is our last slide. Jesus is only begotten. thought I'd say something about this. Because you will get people like Jehovah's Witnesses or other people say, well, if he's begotten, that means he had a beginning. Because the word begotten, that's what it means. Not really. Uh, begotten, words like, and, and words like firstborn. Begotten can just mean to be brought forth. You already existed, but now you're here on the scene, so to speak. Firstborn is actually a term of status. How do we know this? Is it, is it just because, is it true because Mike says it? No. Monogenes is the Greek term for only begotten. Until the late 19th, early 20th century, it was thought, incorrectly, that it came from two Greek words, monos and genao, only, and genao is the verb that means to beget. Later discoveries showed this was wrong. It actually comes from monos only and gene, kind. Monogenes means one of a kind, unique. It has nothing to do with when you start to exist. It's about uniqueness. We know that from this verse, Hebrews eleven seventeen, where Isaac is called Abraham's monogenes. Question. Was Isaac Abraham's first son? No. Ishmael was. That tells you right away the term does not mean. It doesn't have anything to do with when you were born, birth order. Isaac is the monogenes because he's special. He's unique. Why is he unique? He's what? He's the son of 
promise. He's the son of Sarah. He is the one through whom all the promises flow. That's why he's my witness. He's nothing to do with birth. So when you see this in the New Testament, a lot of your more recent translations will have something like unique, one and only, something, something that tries to get away from begotten. That's why. So we'll stop there. That's the last slide. Any questions? I know we're, we're going pretty quickly. That's a lot of unfamiliar stuff. But if you take anything away tonight, what I want you to take away, I'll repeat it again, is that deeply Christian ideas like the Godhead, the co-creator, Jesus is co-creator, Jesus is God in flesh, that somehow there, God had a number two person who was also him. These are Jewish ideas. They are Jewish concepts that they get from their Old Testament that are reinforced between the Testaments by writers that lived before Jesus ever showed up. And so that when Jesus does show up, and when you get the New Testament writers writing, they are writing to an audience that understands these ideas. Then they have to make a choice. Do I believe that Jesus, the, the fellow we just crucified, is, or do we believe that he is who they're saying he was? Do we believe that he rose from the dead? Do we believe that he was God in the flesh? Do we believe that he was the second God? Do we believe this or not? That's where they got to go. They're not sitting there thinking, well, you guys are just a bunch of polytheists. You know, they're not thinking that at all. And I want to start uh, the final week here. We're going to get back into Psalm 82. If you want to get ahead of me, you can go to John 10. Put one finger in John 10 and another finger in Psalm 82. Uh, I want to sort of prep what we're going to spend most of our time on by reviewing this. And I, I have a reason for doing this that I hope will be clear. So early, earlier, I think it was the second week when we went through Old Testament passages that showed a sort of two-ism or two-person Godhead in the Old Testament. That was the easy one to see, uh, that Yahweh was two but yet one, one but yet two. We finished that night by taking a, a look at threeness, okay, a Trinitarian sort of concept from the Old Testament. And I made the comment that if you, if you have your, your mind wrapped around the two and how the two is conveyed, then you will find yourself in certain passages seeing the same descriptions like the name or the word or the angel or something like that. You'll, you'll see those descriptions applied to the spirit or the spirit part of the conversation. And so you get you go from a two to a sort of feeling like there's three different things going on and they're connected because the same description is applied to two of the three or three of the three or something like that. So just to refresh your memory on that point, we looked at this passage real quickly. This is Isaiah 63 and here we have the Lord in the passage, we have the angel, and then we had this statement, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. This was the uh, recounting of the wilderness wandering. And so you have the rebellion and the grieving of the Holy Spirit. But if you go to Psalm 78, which is a recounting of the same itinerary, the same events, the very identical verbs, rebelled and grieved, in Psalm 78 are directed at, in verse 41 here, God, the Holy One of Israel. So again, we knew from evening two that the angel and Yahweh were sort of the same but yet different. And then here we get the spirit that's brought into the conversation when you look at both passages in tandem. So you get this threeness going on. And then we looked at Ezekiel 8. We have the same thing going on here. We have the, these this description of Yahweh as, you know, the God of Israel as a, as a man, sort of a glorified man. <clears throat> and we have the spirit lifting up the prophet. You know, Yahweh puts out the form of a hand. And we saw in other passages 
Again, that was the, the visible Yahweh as opposed to the invisible Yahweh. And the visible Yahweh was usually the angel. And again, you, you, you start going through the, the same set of thought processes. And you get two, and then here we have the spirit referred to in here. So who lifts him up? Is it the embodied Yahweh, the, the, the second visible Yahweh, or is the spirit? And the answer is yes. The writer doesn't really care because it's sort of six of one and half dozen of another. And lower, you know, down in the passage, the either the spirit or this person refers to the temple as my sanctuary. So we know this is God, but it might be God in more than one you know, manifestation or the physical manifestation. And if that's the case, you might actually have the spirit spoken of in the same way as your normal number two guy, the angel. So we talked about these things again, and I'm not trying to be, be clever with a pun here, but like I said last time, you have to sort of triangulate some things to get three in the Old Testament. Two is pretty easy, but three sort of enters the discussion a little bit. Now, this sort of thing is actually used, I believe, in the New Testament. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see uh, critics of Trinitarianism or, again, this traditional Christian view of a God had saying, give me the verse where it shows God is three in one. You know, I want to see that verse. You know, and there are things, you know, you can sort of go to, like the Great Commission, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Well, if they weren't all equal, why would you say that? You know, that sort of thing. And you can go to Acts, um, where the Spirit is referred to with personal pronouns. You've not lied to God. You know, Peter says that. Uh, to Ananias and Sapphira, you've lied to the Spirit, again, sort of equating God and the Spirit. And those are legitimate, okay? Those are legitimate strategies for showing that the Spirit was conceived of as God, okay? Well, the New Testament writers uh, adapt and use what we've been talking about. Now, in the Old Testament, again, you get the two, the two-ness thing going on. You have Yahweh, and then this sort of second Yahweh who's often visible, uh, Yahweh can be simultaneously God in heaven and God on earth, even at the same time. God and the angel can show up at the same time in the same scene. But then you have other passages, like Genesis 48 with Jacob's blessing, where Jacob says, may the God who did this, may the God who did that, may the angel, singular verb, bless the boys. I mean, they're, they're just sort of fused together. You can't tell them apart, and that's, that's deliberate. You know, we talked about that. So you get this two going on. And then the spirit, again, sometimes is brought into the discussion. Well, that's the old in the cream color here. The New Testament, I just want to suggest to you, we spent, again, part of week two and part of week three talking about how the New Testament uses the idea of the invisible and the visible Yahweh and the second person that's embodied, taking a lot of that language and applying it to Jesus. So again, we saw the tunis there and the strategy for, for showing Father, Son, same, same but yet different. The New Testament does something interesting. As God and Jesus are but aren't the same, okay? Jesus is but isn't God. He is God in, in, in person, in essence, but yet he's not the Father. As that goes on in the New Testament, there are New Testament writers who do the same thing between Jesus and the Spirit. That is, the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. And there are, some, there are certain passages like this. I don't know if you've ever noticed these. There aren't too many of them. But in Acts 16, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. Now that links the Spirit in terms of identity to Jesus, who by identity is God. Therefore, you must have three that are the same in identity. Okay? Romans 8, 9, Spirit of God is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. And Galatians 4, God sent the Spirit of his Son okay, into the hearts of believers. Again, we, we're used to thinking of the Holy Spirit, you know, the way he's predominantly described in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God. But there are actually passages that identify the Spirit of God as the Spirit of Jesus. It's as though 
when Jesus ascends, and he's, you know, he's been saying things like, hey, I'm going go to go to my Father, and when I go, I'm going to send the Spirit. And then he'll say things like, where two or three of you are gathered, I am in your midst. And then we get this idea of being indwelled by the Spirit. All these things sort of coordinate together. And, and you get sort of a little bit of extra glue here when the Spirit himself is referred to and identified with Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, not just God, but of Jesus. So you have this same sort of threeness working here, and it builds off this two model. So we've got these two identified, and these two identified, and the central figure is Jesus. He is the glue that unites the, the threesome together. I mean, you, you come out, even if you don't have a verse that lists the three persons, you come out with three different figures co-identified with each other. Okay. It, it, it's Trinitarianism, but from a, just a little bit of a different tack. Now, if that's New Testament theology, okay, if we have a trinity, and you have Jesus as part of a trinity, what about John 10, 34's use of Psalm 82? Now, I've set up the question this way because I, I'm just going to tell you, I have a different view of Psalm 82 than practically anybody you're going to read. Because I think that Psalm 82, John's use of it in the Gospel of John, he uses that and Jesus quotes from it, you know, however you want to look at what's going on there in John. The strategy behind it is to reinforce Jesus' status as God incarnate. Okay, well, what could be controversial about that, Mike? It sounds suspiciously like Trinitarianism. Yeah, it is. What's controversial about it is how you have to look at Psalm 82 to get there. Now, Psalm 82 we looked at in week one. We have God, again Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, also Elohim, he holds judgment. So we talked about this passage where you have Elohim used twice. Once it's a singular individual, and we know that because of grammar, and the other time it's plural, and we know that because of the preposition in the midst of. Okay? So we have divine beings, plural, in Psalm 82, and we talked about why that's not a problem for monotheism, because Elohim is actually a place of residence term. It's not attached to one set of attributes. Because the biblical writers use Elohim of you know, angels and demons and you know, the deceased, human dead, they can't be on an ontological par with God, with the God of Israel. But they're all called Elohim. So the term has to mean something other than a set of attributes. Again, this is history for those of you who've been here the four weeks. You get down to verse 6. <clears throat> this is the verse that John, Je Jesus, is going to quote in John chapter 10. Uh, excuse me, this is Psalm 89. Just bring this in because the, this council is in heavens, the heavens. You get down here to verse 6 in Psalm 82. Now I have the right psalm. The speaker, who is God, Yahweh, says to the Elohim members of his council, I said, you could also translate it, I thought, some of your English translations will have that, that's perfectly legitimate. I said, you are gods, Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you will die. You will fall like any prince. And we talked a little bit about what's going on in the psalm. The biblical Israelites had, let's just go back here, had a, a view based on Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, that <clears throat> Yahweh punished humanity after the Babel event by dispersing the nations, but not only just dispersing the nations. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 says, When the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel was Yahweh's portion. Jacob was his allotted inheritance. Deuteronomy 4 describes the same thing, and it says that Yahweh took Israel as his own. Now, Israel didn't exist at the time of Babel, but it's going to exist in the very next chapter when God calls Abraham. 
Okay, so God forsakes all the nations of, of the earth, says basically, you're not going to obey me, you know, then our relationship is sort of put on ice right now, and I'm going to put you under the authority of other divine beings in my administration. I'm not going to be your personal God anymore. I'm going to start over and create for myself a people that I'm going to be in covenant with, and that people was Israel. And so Genesis 12, we get the call of Abraham, and the rest, as they say, is history. And we talked about the sense in the Old Testament that this leads to the idea of cosmic geography, that Israel it belongs to Yahweh, Yahweh is Israel's God, again, the covenant. But outside of Israel, that ground isn't holy. It's, you know, it, it's under the domain of other, of other entities, other divine beings. Psalm 82 picks up on that. And basically, at the beginning of the psalm, God says, you know, we, we need to have a meeting because you guys are not running things well become corrupt, you know, he starts really railing on them, and it leads to this verse. As a punishment, you know, I said you're gods, I mean, you, we, all, we all know who we're talking to here, we all know who's in the room, but you're going to die like men. I'm going to strip you of your immortality. Now, this gets picked up on later in the Old Testament and the New as sort of part of the end times, the eschaton, when God essentially carries this sentence out and gets rid of, you know, any, you know, the, the, the heavens and the earth are recreated. And those who, human and divine, who are not obedient to Yahweh, lose their status, they lose their position, they're done away with. Um, so we don't want to rabbit trail too far. But it's a theme that gets picked up in the, in the New Testament. Also, through passages like Pentecost and some things Paul says in the epistles, there's this sense that once the church is created, there's a progressive recapturing of the nations that were abandoned at Babel. That's the point of the gospel, to reclaim that which was lost, to reclaim that which was cast aside. This is why when the kingdom of God begins, the disciples are given the ability and Jesus himself starts things off this way by casting out demons. The point was, you have dominion over the powers that govern these places. Go out and get them. When Jesus sends out disciples for the first time, does he send out 12? No, he actually doesn't. He sends out 70. Where does that number come from? Count the nations back at Babel. Guess what? Same number. It's 70. Um, there's all sorts of little intertextual clues as to what's going on. And I don't want to rabbit trail too far ahead, but there's this idea, again, that there are other entities under Yahweh's authority who are less than him, who are called Elohim, they're called sons. Now, what does that have to do with, with John? Okay, well, more or less just summarize that. Well, this is worth pointing out, the middle one here. Yahweh, in this whole worldview, is it's superior to all other Elohim. So that means if Yahweh is superior and Jesus is identified with him, therefore Jesus must be superior too. Okay, he's not just sort of an underling. He is God. Okay. So if the New Testament writers have Jesus as part of a trinity, what's going on? Because we can't have Jesus be less than God. Which brings us to Psalm 82. Now, I have here a web address. If you're interested, if you're having trouble sleeping, okay, at some point, <laughs> I, I gave a, an academic paper on this last year at a, at a scholarly society meeting. Uh, I put it here. Uh, again, if, if you want it, it's free. It's not under copyright or anything like that. But... I also put it in, in here for another reason, for people who are going to be viewing the video in, in the future. This is peer review, okay? When you go to an academic society and you say, hey, I've, I got this view of this passage, what do you think? If they think it's crazy, they're going to tell you. Uh, it's a good place to sort of just go and put a bullseye on your chest and see what happens. And, you know, we did fine because, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the text. It's just the Bible. But here's the key question. 
Does John's use of Psalm 82 weaken or strengthen Jesus' claim to deity? So here's John 10.34. Here's the quotation. What's, what's been going on? Jesus has said what? Four verses earlier. Look at John 10.30. Here's why he's in trouble. What has he said? What are they annoyed at this time? <laughs> what are they annoyed at? I, yeah, I and the Father are one. Well, I mean, that just sets them off. And, and you know, you would expect that, okay? So he's just claimed to be one with the Father. And they're a little bit put out by that. So they get into an argument. And Jesus, for some odd reason, decides, okay, where, you know, I, I have a good handle on the Old Testament. Where do I want to go to sort of, you know, kind of demonstrate for these guys that, that I can say this? Oh, I know. Psalm 82, verse 6. It just seems like, wow, what an odd choice. But this is what he does. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am a son of God? And he said, what, what's the argument? Most people take what's called the mortal view of this. They believe that the Elohim of Psalm 82 are just people. So what that means is, if you go back here, the quotation, I said ye are gods, God, the speaker, would be talking to people. So the argument is that Jesus knows that. He knows that there are no other Elohim out there. They're just people. So Probably Jesus has in mind other Jewish leaders or, or maybe just the Jews in general. Therefore, John has Jesus using Psalm 82.6 to say, in effect, that he can call himself the Son of God when every other Jew can too. Now I ask you, does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? How does that defend I and my Father are one? Is everybody else one with a father too? It just doesn't make any sense. It, frankly, it's a lame argument if that's what he means. <laughs> so don't be upset because, you know, other humans can do this too. Ta-da! You know, like, like <laughs> I guess I showed you guys. Now go off and call yourselves, you know, equal with God too. Leave me alone. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But this is the dominant view of this passage. Now, the reason that it is is, is kind of understandable because people get nervous about having the Elohim of Psalm 82, the plural ones, be divine beings. Okay, and we talked about that in verse 1. Go, oh, what about monotheism and all this stuff? And again, my answer to that is you haven't really thought well about what Elohim means. That, that, that's the first problem. But let's take it apart a little bit. <clears throat> now, Here's how the argument is made. If the Elohim of Psalm 82 are Jewish elders, Exodus 22, 6 through 8 usually gets thrown into the mix. So you, you can turn there if you want to. You have a description. Again, these are just some references to, this one's actually public. This, this is a pre-published version, so feel free to, to take it if you want it. Um, this passage is a description of a dispute where the people who are in the dispute bring their argument before Elohim. And so people say, aha, here's an example where you have Jewish leaders called Elohim. Go to the passage and look. What you have is you have Elohim really referring to God, the singular God. You, do, you never have in the entirety of the Old Testament you never have Jews or Jewish elders called Elohim. Exodus 18 is another passage. This is when Jethro says to Moses, hey, you ought to appoint some helpers. You know, like this is just too much for you. You're kind of 
you know, you, you spend the whole day, you know, talking about, should you be wearing this cloth? Is it mixed with that one? And I mean, just, you know, give yourself a break. Get some help. And Moses says, you know, that's a great idea. So he appoints elders. They're never called Elohim in the passage. All you got to do is go read it. They're never called that. But it's assumed that these guys, judging matters of the law, are these guys. That's how the argument's made. Well, we know these guys existed in Israel, these, el these judge guys that helped Moses decide matters of the law. And, you know, eventually that became the Sanhedrin, like in the New Testament, this group of people who, who helped with this. So the assumption is these guys must be what's referred to here in Exodus 22. After all, it's four chapters after Exodus 18. So, you know, these must be the gods that, that Psalm 82 is talking about. Now, now think about it. You don't need to know Hebrew for this. If you go back to Psalm 82, where's Psalm 82 and Psalm 89? Where's the council? It's in the heavens. The last time I checked, okay, no Jewish leadership ever, like, had meetings in the heavens. Not only that, but in Psalm 82, what is the crime that they're being accused of, the Elohim? They have judged the nations badly, okay? At no time in the entire Old Testament are Jews ever put over in a judgeship role, a leadership role, an administrative role of, of all the other nations. In fact, they're forbidden from contact with the other nations. It's exactly the opposite situation. So it, it just doesn't make sense on a, on a number of levels. And people have realized this, so they've gone to argument number two. You're right, argument number one is kind of dumb. But this one's better. Maybe it's just Jews in general that are Elohim. And we're going to latch on to this phrase, those to whom the word of God came. I'll bet that refers to the Jewish nation receiving the law at Sinai. Because you know, Psalm 82 does, says, doesn't it say in your law that those to whom the word of God came? Well, wait a minute. What's actually quoted? Is there anything in a Sinai scene quoted? No, it's Psalm 82. So it, it, it's not about the law. Not only that, but if you go to Psalm 82, there's no mention of Sinai. Just read the whole, it, it's not a long psalm. Just read the psalm. There's no mention of Sinai. And in the Sinai accounts, well, maybe we'll go back and look at the Sinai accounts. Guess what? Jews are never called Elohim there either. So again, it, it sort of like sounds like it might work, but when you really think about it, 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 it just you know, vaporizes. Okay, it doesn't make any sense. But you can see why, you know, it's, it's important. Because again, you have, the, the, the problem is, is again, this feeling of, oh, I don't want multiple Elohim, what do I do with that? I, I have to make them people. Whew, you know, that, that's much more comfortable. Well, it's not really a problem, but a lot of people think it is. Last resort. Jews are called my son, by God. In other words, the nation is referred to as my son. And this is when Moses goes, you know, gets his commission from God. And God says, I want you to go back to Pharaoh, and this is what you tell him. You know, let my people go. Let my son go into the wilderness to worship me. So the nation is referred to as God's son. And, you know, we understand why. They're God's offspring and all that kind of stuff. This isn't a solution either. Because, again, Sinai, it's not about Sinai. Nothing in John 10 is about Sinai. And again, the Elohim of Psalm 82 are in, in the heavens. So there's really no connection here. But this is still important. Jews are called my son by God. Who else in the Old Testament is called the son of God? Anybody? It, it's pretty rare. This is one. There are actually two other passages, and it's the same person. It's, it's called, God God looks at the person and says, my son. The king. Okay, the king of Israel. Um, so now think about that. When Jesus is in this conversation with the Pharisees, 
And he's claiming, in, according to John 10.30, you know, I and my father are one. Then he quotes Psalm 82 and says, hey, you know, you guys are upset, but here you go. Psalm 82.6, why are you upset that I refer to myself as the son of God? Is Jesus claiming to be the nation? Well, you know, it would be kind of odd. Is he claiming to be the king? No. Well, you know, you, there, there, there is one verse earlier in the gospel that, that uses that language, but he doesn't claim that in the passage. So what, what could he possibly be th thinking about? Why Psalm 82, 6? Not corporate Israel, not the king, who's left? Who are, are the, is there anybody else that's referred to as son of God or sons of God? Yeah, Psalm 82, that's the only other place. Okay, you're going to find this. In Job 1 and 2, you have sons of God. But this is the only other place where they're Elohim and sons of the Most High are connected. So what is he claiming then? He's claiming to be more than human because the Elohim of Psalm 82 are not human. That's where he's starting the debate. Okay, I've just said I and my father are one. You guys are, are torqued. Okay. Let's start with something simple. Doesn't your own Bible say... that there are Elohim, there are sons of God that are not human. If they know their Bible, they would say, yeah, well, that's true. Are you claiming to be more than human, Jesus? Well, like, weren't you paying attention four verses ago? God isn't human, is he? I and the Father are one. Can't you guys even think this far? Okay. It's just a starting point for him. He takes the quotation at face value, and so do I, divine beings. It's from Psalm 82, and they're not humans. Again, cross-reference here, and reasons why to eliminate the other view. Again, these other human or non-humans are the ones over the nations. We'll just skip through this. So he says, I said, you're gods, sons of the Most High. If you look at it, Go, go to look at Psalm 82 if, you ha if you're not turned there. If you're, if you're still in John 10, put a finger in it. Just walk through the passage. Who is the speaker? The speaker is God. God is looking at a group of Elohim, the heavenly host. And he's upset. And he looks at them, these non-human beings, and says, I said you're gods, sons of the Most High all of you. Nevertheless, like humans, you will die. You're going to die like any man and fall like any prince. God is the speaker accusing divine beings of messing up and says, I'm going to strip away your immortality. So when Jesus inserts himself or uses this passage, he's claiming, first of all, to be more than man. It's the only conclusion you can draw. That's step one. I'm establishing the point that there are sons of God who are not people. That's point number one. Now, what does he do then? Or what's the effect? Here are the two views contrasted. Here's the, the human view, and here's what I'm going to argue for here. The word of God that came is not a reference to the law at Sinai. It is the actual utterance out of God's mouth in Psalm 82. That's the word of God who's coming to the, to the ones hearing it, the Elohim. The word of God is the utterance itself, the pronouncement from God that you're in trouble. The effect is this. Jesus reminds his detractors that there are, again, non-human divine beings who get to call themselves this. Third, if you link this statement with John 10.30 and the verses that follow, Jesus is claiming to be divine. If I'm not human, what would I be? <laughs> okay, if I'm not human, do the math, fellows, you know. Do the math, Pharisees. If I'm not human, I'm divine. 
So he goes to Psalm 82 to, to establish this point. Now, if you look at the passage, look at what he's doing. He's just said, I and my father are one. They get mad at him. The Jews answered him and said, for a good work, we're not going to stone you, but for blasphemy. If he was claiming to be just a, you know, a human being down here, when he quotes Psalm 82, 6, if, if he's just saying, hey, look, guys, calm down. I'm just saying the same thing that you guys can say. We're all children of God. If, if that's what he's saying, why would they be mad? They know he's not saying that. Isn't it written in your law, I said, you are God's? So. I and the Father are one. The Father is in me, and I in him. Look at these two claims. They're about as dramatic as you can get, especially this one. If they know their Old Testament, the stuff we've been talking about for the last three weeks, the Father, the Father is in me. Remember the whole thing about the name being Yahweh that was in the angel. And, you know, you just run, run with it from there. He's saying, "I'm number two. I'm the number two guy." Back in your Old Testament, these are dramatic statements, and in between. He quotes Psalm 82. And again, his point is, look, first we have to establish that there are divine beings, there are non-humans who are sons of God. But I'm more than that. The Father is in me, and I in him. Now, if they know Psalm 82, and they do, because they're not happy. I mean, th this doesn't solve anything for them. They're still mad at him. If they know Psalm 82, they know that not only by virtue of this quotation, is Jesus saying, I'm more than human. When he gets to this, he's saying, not only am I more than human, not only am I like in Psalm 82, but the character in Psalm 82 that I really am is the Lord of the Council. I am Yahweh in flesh, right here in front of you. That's why he's using Psalm 82. He's establishing his divine nature, and also, when he gets down here, his authority. I'm not only more than human. I'm even more than anybody in heaven. <laughs> okay? Let's just up the ante a little bit. Instead of shrinking back and saying, I'm just like you guys. Don't be mad at me. I mean, he just goes the other direction. Just does not about face and gives it to him both barrels. So, another way of putting it, his logic, the problem is, again, for the Jews, not for us, but the problem is Jesus makes himself God. So, here's his chain of thinking. Other non-humans are Elohim. I'm justifying my claim by showing you that. I'm more than human. I also claimed in 1030 to be the one with the Father, so we're co-identified in some way. All this is provable by my works. Look back here. For which of the works do you stone me? And of course, they're, they're going to deny that. You know, it's not that. We're stoning you for blasphemy. What's his point in bringing up the works? If my claims aren't true, how could I do what I do? In other words, if I'm just like making it up here, and I'm looking for the exits while I'm doing it, okay, if I'm just making it up here, how am I able to do what you've seen me do? Okay, it's your turn to talk. <laughs> it, it, he has these moments with the Pharisees that he, he just boxes them in. He just boxes them in. So, basically I have a biblical precedent and I work miracles. What else would you like? <laughs> you know, I, I have somewhere to hang this on, the idea that I'm more, more than, than human. You know, their sons of God are not just people. I am more than a man. Not only that, I'm one with the Father, the Father's in me, and I'm him, and I work miracles. Any questions? <laughs> you know, he, he's, again, he's boxing them in with this. Because they, they know Psalm 82, they got nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go, because he's, he's using scripture against them, like, you know, like he normally does. 
So by way of summary, I want to get through the summary, and then we, if you have any questions just generally, we can take them. The four weeks I've tried to get you, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than this, but the Old Testament has, again, the categories that we think of, that we attribute to, that we associate with Christianity. Christianity is very Jewish in that respect. Okay, this is why we accept the Old Testament as well as the New. One grows out of the other. The promises are made in one and fulfilled in the other. Okay, you, you, you know all that. But I want you to get to, to think about the fact that some of these ideas that are so intimately associated with Christianity, they don't just come out of the blue. They don't just come out of the ether. There's something going on here that ties them to what God said and did earlier. It's not like, you know, we have like a shift where there's like a, uh, there's a new planet, or there's a new God, or there's a new something or whatever. You know, the, that's the old, this is the new, and there's never the twain shall meet. The, the, the twain meets a lot. It meets an awful lot. Even in something as fundamental as this. Christians saw the second Godhead member incarnated as a man in Jesus. We talked about that last week. Godhead thinking, again, was around long before the New Testament. It's not late. It's not a late invention, that a lot of scholars like to say. Divine plurality is not a denial of monotheism. Okay? There's a reason why a Jew who loved God in the first century could be willing to be put to death rather than say Caesar is God, and then in the next breath say, I'm going to pray to Jesus and not feel at all like he violated monotheism. One was a clear violation. The other was, of course it's not. There's a reason why they could think that in their heads. And it's because they had these categories in the Old Testament that Caesar didn't fall into. Again, we looked at Old Testament trajectories about some of the things other religions say. The word in John 1.1 1, 1 is not any god. He's the word. And we looked at passages in the Old Testament where the word was Yahweh. I mean, it says it point blank. Jeremiah 1 is a great passage to go to. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Jeremiah addresses the word as Yahweh. And then in verse 9, the word of the Lord reached out his hand and touched me. I mean, come on. How much clearer can you get? That's like reading something in the New Testament. Yahweh also has no equal among the Elohim of his counsel. Jesus and other divine sons of God are not brotherly equals. Now this is really directed at Mormonism. As Mormons love Psalm 82, uh, there are Mormons on the internet that, you know, like they're fans of mine. <laughs> because I, you know, I'm, I'm into Psalm 82. And they like that. You know, and, and you have to sort of slap them on the wrist occasionally and say, look, you guys are thinking this. You can't possibly think that right? and get that from the data because Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim or Yahweh. He doesn't have equal brothers. And if he doesn't have equal brothers, neither does Jesus. Okay, it's, 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 it's not terribly complicated. But again, this is where, this is the parting of the ways between what we would call, you know, in, in evangelical Christianity, an orthodox view of Trinitarianism and something that would, you know, would be in, uh, part of Mormon theology. Psalm 82 provides no justification for humans being divine. Now, this is a little word for, again, my detractors out there in video land who love the human view. My question to you is, why aren't you a Mormon? Because if you believe humans are Elohim, you're about that far away. You're about that far away from embracing a cardinal idea in Mormon theology. Mormon theology teaches that Yahweh was once a man. And you, as believers, when you're glorified, you will eventually become God, you know, just like Yahweh is. 
Okay, that is not what Psalm 82 says. But if you're looking at Psalm 82 and you're somehow importing humanity into Elohim language, you're about that close. Okay, you're about that close. So I would encourage you to re-examine that idea. Not only doesn't it make sense in John 10, but it sort of drifts over into that other territory. So that was the last slide.